and welcome to the October 18th, 2022 meeting of the City of Lakeland Planning and Zoning Board. The board meets every third Tuesday of the month to review proposals for changing the city's comprehensive plan, its future land use map, zoning changes consistent with the map, and conditional use permits. The board is made up of seven members appointed by the city commission and is assisted by the staff of the Community and Economic Development Department and the city attorney's office. Staff will advance any presentation slides that should have been provided prior to the meeting. The meeting is divided into two parts. The first part is a public hearing where we expect to hear new applicants explain their request and receive comments from affected parties. The second part of the meeting is termed the general meeting and primarily consists of acting on recommendations from staff about the cases that came up in the previous month's meeting. We invite everyone who wishes to participate to be heard. We do ask that you be concise in your comments and that speakers avoid being repetitive. That is, if several people have pointed out traffic concerns, there is no need to hear additional comments regarding traffic again. But we would like to hear anything new that has not been addressed. In order to allow everyone to have an opportunity to speak, there will be a three-minute time limit for each speaker and the clerk has a timer for this purpose. We respectfully ask that you adhere to this rule. We also ask at this time that you silence all mobile devices. Also, when you come up to speak, please identify yourself as well as your address. That being said, Silvana, would you read the... Item number one, major modification and expansion of an existing conditional use to allow for the expansion of of existing health care clinic on property located at 1129 North Missouri Avenue. Concurrent with this request, the applicant is also requesting the vacation of a portion of the right of way for North Missouri Avenue between West 4th Street and West 5th Street. Owner, Central Florida Healthcare Incorporated, applicant Timothy Campbell, and this is a consideration of a final decision. Good morning for the record, Philip Scarce, Principal Planner with Community Economic Development. Um, just start with the location, this is 1129 North Missouri. This is just uh, right up in North Florida, across from the Lakeland High football field. It's that uh, familiar blue uh, clinic building that we all know when we drive by in North Florida. Um, Description of the site, um, uh, mentioned that there's a, a vacation of uh, Missouri, so it's just, um, if you look at this uh, plan here, this, this location, um, they've uh, requested the vacation of this portion of Missouri, and then there's also uh, an alley running right here uh, that's, uh, that's being vacated, uh, and then there's another, there's another easement on this side of the site um, that's, uh, but those are, unre those are related to the request, but, um, uh, you're only concerned about the, um, well, you'd be only concerned about the, the, the PUD modification. The right-of-way vacations and the alley vacations are running concurrent with this, um, uh, and, uh, the, the conditions of approval are based on those, uh, these, these being vacated by the city commission. So the applicant uh, proposes a, a modification to the existing conditional use permit um, to allow a, a three-story, 23,000 square foot medical facility. Um, we get our bearings straight. Um, this is a north-south. This is Missouri. Uh, this is North Florida Avenue. If you remember on the back previous slide, the clinic structure was, uh, the existing clinic is, is here. This would be a relocation of the clinic facility um, uh, to here. This is uh, Fifth Street, and then this is Fourth Street. Uh, so they'd relocate the clinic facility um, at this location with a, uh, and we have some uh, slides with a very nice uh, pedestrian uh, plaza entry feature off of North Florida, and then the associated parking for the clinic. Right now, the conditional use permit is just everything uh, east of um, 
Missouri Avenue. So there, this is, uh, as you mentioned, this is an expansion. So the, this, this would all come in under the existing conditional use permit. There were some previous commercial use permits on this site uh, here that was related to the church to allow for some overflow parking. Um, but the Central Florida Healthcare, they, they bought these, um, they bought this parcel. So they'll be expanding. Um, so Central Florida will be expanding on, on this parcel. Uh, just go some slides around the site. This is uh, looking southwest on 5th Street. Looking into the site. This is looking west on 5th Street. This is looking south uh, along Missouri Avenue. This is the portion of the right-of-way that would be vacated. And you can see the existing clinic structure here. This is looking north, standing on site across, uh, looking, uh, this is approximately where the, the building would be uh, sitting, and you can see there's a vacant lot. Um, there's some church uh, facilities across the street from this on 5th Street. And this is on site, uh, looking southeast, back towards uh, Florida Avenue, and this is the adjacent church. And then you can see the, the football field there in the background. This is looking east on New York Avenue. So on New York Avenue, there's a, um, uh, some new single family homes built by the CRA um, that uh, they would be looking um, uh, into this, into the parking area. The proposed building would be going right around here. And then this would be parking. And we have some conditions that would kind of buffer this parking from the adjacent uh, residential uses that are there on New York Avenue. So with that said, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to this uh, site plan. I'm going to leave, give it over to uh, Tim Campbell, who's going to talk about, uh, he's going to represent, he's represent the applicant, and he's got some um, more things to show you as well. So. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, board members. For purposes of your record, my name is Tim Campbell with the law firm of Clark Campbell Lancaster Workman and Earth, 500 South Florida Avenue. Here today representing Central Florida Healthcare, Inc. Um, our team is Ann Clausen, the CEO, and Lawrence Best, the COO, who are both uh, tied up in meetings this morning, so they're sorry that they were unable to attend, and Alan Dezaeus, our project manager. Um, before I start, just to kind of go through this, to explain a little flavor on this plan, um, this corner parcel, you saw it was an out parcel in the, um, the other plan too. The, the title on that parcel, I think will take about 100 years to ever straighten out. Um, Central Florida Healthcare, there were some, some miscellaneous parcels along the North Florida Avenue frontage um, two were the Polk County School Board, that were formerly City of Lakeland, and then there was a private party that owned this parcel. All of those were acquired. They would love to and hope at some point to be able to acquire this, but it, at this point in time, it was a, uh, we were unable to do so. Um, Philip described um, the, the right-of-way vacation will just be a portion of this, leaving Missouri Avenue in place to provide um, existing access and traffic circulation for the church, and there's just an alley that falls in this area um, that we're seeking to vacate, but he's right. That's not what we're deciding today, but that's just kind of a little background into what we're doing. Also, he described, it's harder to see, but this little cross-hatched area, kind of the grayed out area, is the existing structure. And then this is the proposed um, expansion and replacement facility. So Central Florida Healthcare has received funding to improve and expand its provision of healthcare services uh, to its existing clinic, um, to consolidate some services that are currently housed elsewhere, and to add additional indigent healthcare services to the community. Um, in 2021, just a little background on Central Florida Healthcare, they serve more than 45,000 healthcare patients and more than 29,000 dental patients. Uh, they have about 14 sites throughout Polk, Highlands, and Hardy County. Uh, this is one of their major facilities and at which they provide uh, services to the indigent. And while we have an active conditional use, you heard Philip describe that the parcels to the west have been acquired and they are being added, and the parcels 
uh, along the frontage of North Florida Avenue that I just made reference to. So we're adding that and we've, um, we've proposed this site plan for the new facility. Once approved, the plan is to keep the existing facility in place so as not to disrupt the delivery of healthcare services to the community, construct the new facility behind it, immediately behind it, uh, then to remove the existing facility and, and begin operation there. Um, we also, as you can see, and this is part of the city's, uh, it's, it's kind of in a, an urban type of um, overlay for the city. So we've created this hardscape, a landscape hardscape that kind of connects the, the new building uh, to North Florida Avenue. So that's a part of our, part of our plan. I want to show you a couple pictures just to give you a better idea. So this is the rendering. Um, as you can see, kind of giving a little hardscape in the front with the, the fencing and landscaping, uh, the building there um, behind it. Let me switch out to. And there's kind of the landscape, hardscape, landscaped hardscape. <laughs> Sounds like it's repeated. Um, connecting the building there to North Florida Avenue um, once constructed. Can I interrupt you for a second? If you're going to have lengthy conversations in the back of the room, could you please take them outside? Thank you. So that's our plan. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's just allowing them to, to build this new facility to provide health care services to the community. Uh, we stand for any questions that you may have. Uh, request an opportunity to respond to any public comment that you receive and respectfully request your favorable recommendation of CUP 22-13. Anyone with any questions of Mr. Campbell? The zoning on this is still anticipated to remain residential, is that correct? It is. It's just always been the underlying um, zoning. It's been a facility for a very long time, so the, the way to... Um, most efficiently accomplish this is just to expand the conditional use that's already in place to allow the additional parcels in use. And this is a um, neighborhood health clinic. It does serve that neighborhood there, so it does provide a um, vital service to that area. Mr. Campbell, um, just to clarify, the existing um, clinic will remain in operation during construction and will be demolished following the new building. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes, sir. Okay, and also one more question. Um, uh, that parking, um, I believe on um, the church um, previously, um, um, will you be providing a shared parking agreement within the law them to use this parking on during their services? I can't tell you with certainty because I'm not aware of any conversations, but I'm, I, I, as I was sitting back there, I anticipated this question and um, whatever agreements in place now, I, I doubt on um, Sunday mornings that the clinic is really um, very active. And so I would imagine that, yes, they would absolutely continue whatever agreements in place to provide overflow parking. Uh, there may even be an easement. I, I've not done the title work that relates to the church. Um, so whatever they're doing now, I understand they will continue to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kenna, how much, uh, is it, how much will the capacity for service uh, increase with this new building, do you know? What's the increase in capacity? As far as number of beds and so forth, they would have available. The, this isn't a hospital, so I don't know that there's, there are beds for, that they're not overnight stays. Um, I know what they're doing is bringing, they have some ancillary services that are housed in other places throughout the city, and their goal, in, once they had this funding in place, was to consolidate those things so they can kind of a one-stop shop kind of place for the patients that they serve. I know that the new facility is approximately, approximately 23,000 square feet three, on three stories. Um, I don't know the, the square footage of the existing building, but... Doubling? So the existing building is about 15,000. Um, so we're adding, adding about 8,000 square feet of capacity. But in the ability, uh, the, the existing building so old, there's a lot more efficiencies that can be gained when you construct the new building. So probably eight to 10,000 square feet. And it's primarily indigent areas. Correct. Yes, sir. 
Are the hours of operation going to change? I do not understand that the hours of operation are going to change. I think whatever their hours now are, are, are suited to, to the, you know, the community that they serve, and I think those will continue. Any other questions from the board? Any comments or questions from the audience? Okay. That being said, uh, I would entertain a motion to... Uh, to and so, um, let me just go back to my presentation. And um, one uh, detail that I um, failed to mention, I apologize, uh, is that this facility will also include a, uh, a drive-through, a drive-up pharmacy for its patients. Not like a commercial pharmacy, but just for a, you know, a, a drive-through pharmacy for the, for the patients that are, that are being served there. So just wanted to include that as well. Um, yeah, so we have uh, recommended conditions. Uh, I'm going to go through those right now. So A, the permitted uses will be a health care clinic with a drive through pharmacy as an accessory use. Um, B, site development plan. The project shall be developed in a substantial accordance with the site development plan, including uh, included with attachment C, uh, approval of, um, with the approval of the community economic development director. Minor adjustments may be made at the time of site plan approval without requiring a modification to this conditional use. C, uh, development standards uh, in accordance with the RA4 urban neighborhood context, subdistrict standards except the minimum um, maximum building height shall be limited to three stories. Uh, outdoor lighting uh, shall be oriented and shielded uh, in, a, uh, in accordance with section 4.6 of the Land Development Code to avoid um, uh, light spillage into uh, the adjacent residential uses. E, the architectural design a non -res as a non-residential use of principal buildings shall be subject to design standards for the principal buildings specified under section 3.4.7 of the Lakeland Land Development Code. The US 98 North frontage, uh, road frontage, uh, landscape and fencing treatment shall be developed in accordance with attachment D. The buffer shall be a minimum of nine and a half feet of width and consist of a five foot high decorative fence with staggered masonry columns every 25 feet and a minimum uh, number of shrubs of 16 plus four B medium trees and two large A trees per 100 feet uh, or a linear fraction thereof. Landscaping and buffering as specified by section 4.5.7.3 of the Land Development Code and table 4.5-1 of the Land Development Code and landscape frontage buffer a minimum width of, of uh, five feet, a type A hedge, and eight C small trees per 100 linear feet or fractions thereof shall be constructed and maintained where the off-street parking and vehicle use areas abuts any adjacent public streets. And that would include that New York Avenue frontage as well. Any questions? Any transportation conditions? A binding concurrency determination shall be made with site plan submittal. Number two, a transit shelter shall be installed along the site's US 98 North um, Florida Avenue frontage with final decision and location that is determined to be acceptable by the Lakeland Area Mass Transit District. A transit stop easement shall be granted to uh, Lakeland Area Mass Transit District for any portion of the transit stop that is located outside of the public right of way. Number three, a decorative Pedestrian promenade at least 12 feet wide with a permanent seating enhanced landscaping shall be constructed between the principal clinic entrance and the US 98 North, North Florida Avenue sidewalk. Sidewalk shall be constructed, this is number four, uh, along the site's public uh, street frontages in compliance with the Land Development Code. ADA compliant pedestrian route shall be constructed from principal clinic entrance to the West 5th Street and 4th Street um, frontages. Uh, number five, bicycle parking shall be provided within 40 feet of and be of an entrance and should be visible from the principal clinic entrance in compliance with section 4.11.6 of the Land Development Code and index 900 of the city's engineering standards manual. Number six, development plan shall comply with the Florida Department of Transportation permitting requirements. And lastly, number seven, prior to site plan approval, all accessory um, right-of-way sections, uh, all necessary, excuse me, right-of-way sections of North Missouri and the existing north-south alley between 4th and 5th Street uh, shall be vacated by the city of Lakeland. 
and just to, wanted to go uh, just a little bit further with conditions. This is the existing attachment C of the of the existing conditional use permit. So this map will be replaced with uh, again the site plan exhibit. So this will be the new exhibit C, and we mentioned exhibit D, which is the applicant's. Um, uh, rendering that he, he showed. So we're including that as the ordinance as well, just give some references um, when the ordinance is adopted. So, you know, and five years from now, if this comes in and, and nobody's here, because they look back and say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is what was intended for that, for that frontage. So, uh, staff does recommend approval, and we stand for any questions you may have. And, and, and for clarification as well, the uh, uh, condition E that Philip read does include an additional sentence with some detail about that buffer that's not shown on right. the screen. And so we want to make sure that we're clear that whatever action is taken by the board accounts for what Philip read uh, in terms of the, the masonry columns and just the, the, the landscaping associated with that buffer, since that is key. Now, are there any other questions from the board? Just one question. When, when the city vacates the right away, is that done as, um, a process when they're going through so we wouldn't just vacate it and then if this thing doesn't come to fruition they, they have it how does that work um what the what the applicant will do and, and they've already done this is they've made official requests with our property information office they vet the the the, the request with all the utility providers it could within the within the the, the rights away or the easements then that goes forward to the uh, ultimately ends up being approved by the city commission um, what we'll need to do is look at the area next to the Williams property because with, the, with that alley section, typically, um, if you've got two abutting property owners, it's split 50-50. Uh, but in terms of anything that's within the campus itself, uh, surrounded by the, the applicant's property, then that would be conveyed to them and they would pay a, pay a fee to, to, uh, to account for that, that land. And I would just add that right away needs vacated, whether they ever did this or not, but they have the funding and are... Uh, absolutely ready to go. But the alley near uh, North Florida Avenue, there are actually parking spaces over it. So it is definitely unused. Uh, and, and so we will proceed, even if this didn't happen for some strange reason, we would proceed with a um, vacation of right of way effort regardless, because they now own all the parcels on both sides of that uh, right of way. Mr. Campbell, can you, do you have any comment on the proposed conditions? We've discussed this with staff and met with them and worked through that, so we, uh, we, the conditions are acceptable to the applicant. Any other questions? I just have a quick question that might not have anything to do with this, but during Friday night football games, um, will that parking lot be accessible? Or where are they going to park? Well, they have the entire lot, the, the entire vacant lot to the south. Um, there has been some overflow parking um, on the Central Florida Healthcare site. Uh, I don't know if also at the church uh, it's caused issues. Uh, we have discussed with the Polk County School Board uh, an agreement that allows them to do to use it for parking if they desire. Uh, with the normal customary, uh, they clean it up and they have insurance in place. So I um, think we're willing to do that. I don't know that it's going to happen, but. Um, but they do have that entire parcel that they, uh, that Polk County School Board owns and controls immediately to our south. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? We're going to pan a motion to approve the request of the Central Florida Health Care Clinic. Motion subject to, to the conditions. Motion to approve as uh, submitted and with the conditions from the staff. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Item number two, conditional use to allow a special event venue on property located at 417 North Massachusetts Avenue, owner FURC1 LLC, applicant Albert Moore Construction, consideration of final decision. This request was, with, was withdrawn by the applicant, so we're not uh, going to hear this case today. So there's no action required by the board. It's withdrawn, so we can move on to the next item. Okay. Item three, annexation, a small scale land use amendment to apply a future land use designation of Business Park 
and the application of PUD plan unit development zoning concurrent with a city initiated request to apply a suburban special purpose context district designation to allow for the development of 22,800 square feet of office uses on approximately 11.12 acres, generally located west of Pipkin Creek Road, south of Sugar Creek Drive West, and north of Creek Bend Drive. Owner, Marco Bay Construction Incorporated. Applicant, Marco Bay Construction Incorporated. Again, good morning for the record, Philip Scarce, Community Economic Development. Um, we have a requested annexation, uh, land use amendment, um, PUD zoning and, um, and a zoning to apply um, a context district to this site. So this location of the site, uh, go better. this is Pipkin Creek Road. This is the site right here. This is the uh, Sugar Creek uh, subdivision that's uh, in unincorporated uh, Polk County. Again, the city limits right here and uh, there's city limits across here. The applicants uh, request the, um, the annexation to bring this into the city and to allow up to 22,800 um, square foot of office uses. Um, so you see there's a significant uh, wetland floodplain uh, within the site that, that kind of uh, that acts as a buffer to the, uh, to the residential uses up at uh, Sugar Creek there. So this, is the, this would be the residential, single family residential that's in, in, in Polk County right now. Um, uh, site access off of uh, Pipkin Creek Road um, with the two 11,400 square foot uh, office structures. Um, this is, uh, uh, got some email regarding this uh, little piece right here. These are actually dumpster locations. Um, this is something that we would probably request to uh, relocate uh, somewhere on the site uh, away from the residential uses that are that abut the site. Just going around the site, this is uh, from 4202 Pipkin Creek Road looking west at the site. It's currently wooded. It's uh, standing at the Heritage Baptist Church. This is from the driveway on Pipkin Creek Road, road looking west at the site. This is from the driveway looking south at the site. This is from the existing entrance on Pipkin Creek Road looking west at the site. And this is the proposed uh, PUD site plan. Again, um, uh, just public hearing only today. Um, we will come back uh, with a recommendation um, at next month's meeting uh, with a recommendation of the PUD, the annexation, um, and the zone to apply the suburban special purpose context district. Um, proposed uh, land use district uh, is a business park, uh, future land use district. Um, this is an 11.12 acre site. Um, so it'll have a business park center, future land use, a PUD zoning category, and a suburban special purpose um, uh, context district for the development uh, when, this, when it occurs. With that, we stand for any questions, and uh, we'll let the applicant speak if they are here, and, and uh, see if any, uh, anybody uh, is here for the, for the audience as well. Um, I have a quick question. I did, this is just more for me. What are the benefits of being annexed into the city versus just staying in the county? Well, you get city services. Um, you know, they, they, to uh, to do something like this, you need to connect to um, to water and have to, especially sewer. Uh, so when you need city sewer services, you have to sign an annexation agreement regardless. Um, uh, this was an opportunity for, for them to uh, get the sewer and to, uh, to annex. If this wasn't uh, contiguous with the city and they still wanted the sewer service, and they would uh, still apply for a, a, an annexation, and then we would annex once the city became contiguous with the site. That's just curious. Yep. Any other questions? The wetlands that are shown there, is this a uh, canal system, or is this tied to anything, or is this just natural lowland wetland areas? Those are um, natural wetland area. 
Yeah. <coughs> I like the Pumpkin Applicant speed. System. It's a Pitkin Creek. Pitkin Creek, yeah. Go ahead. Good morning again, Tim Campbell, uh, Clark Campbell Lancaster, worked in an air 500 South Florida Avenue here representing Marco Bay Construction and the owner of the property is actually Parkway Partners One. Um, this is, this wetlands is part of a, a natural system, it's just a part of it. Parkway Partners, the name of the entity that purchased it because it was purchased along with other parcels within the neighboring Parkway Corporate Center. It was intended all along to be an extension of the Parkway Corporate Center, but because of this natural wetlands, it, just, it didn't make sense to, to tie it in. And so they've come in to use the, the frontage of those parcels for the two office buildings that are proposed. And of course, we certainly will move the dumpster away from the residential area, so that's just one of the things that was missed in the design. Um, so it's, it's a pretty basic approach. They're there on Pipkin Creek Road. Um, the, just so you know, the crossing across that kind of, that conveyance, the wetland area exists. So it's, it's already in place. It's not something that, um, that we are create, we will probably improve, but that it's already in place. And so it's just utilizing, and to the annexation, and Philip explained it correctly, whenever you seek to receive city utilities, water or sewer, they ask that you sign a, a petition to annex so that when you are adjacent, you are annexed. It's largely a city function um, that if they're serving you utilities that they also want you to be in the city and so we will become city taxpayers um, as part of the annexation. But that's just part of the typical process uh, when receiving city utilities. Um, and so Drew Phillips is here from, from the owner and, and from Marco Bay if you have any questions. Um, we think it's a pretty straightforward request. It's consistent with what's been intended all along. We don't, we've been sensitive to the, the neighbors to this property, but I think there's been that understanding that this was ultimately going to be developed initially along with Parkway Corporate Center, and I don't think you've received any uh, material responses of, of opposition. And so we would respectfully uh, request your favor. Actually, today you're not taking action, so uh, we'll stand for any questions that you have. Questions, Mr. Kennedy, board. Um, was this a part of the original request through Polk County? It just wasn't developable? Um, you know, I thought this went through something uh, years ago. Um, I just became involved, so I haven't been in this, this um, process for a while. I thought historically, and I don't know if Drew remembers, but historically there was some effort to do a larger building and get approvals. And it's, it, it wasn't done, so there, you know, that's not the approvals that are in place. But I think this wetland was something that you, ne you needed to respect, and so you couldn't design around or over it, and so that, that was abandoned. But it was purchased to, to kind of round out and allow Parkway Corporate Center to also have access to Pipkin Creek, and it just made no sense because of the wetlands that are in place. Is that a man-made pond on the southwest quadrant? It is a man-made pond on the southwest quadrant. And that services the this site. park or this site? This site. That's to be constructed. It's actually dug for the request. That will also serve us. I'm sorry, I'm corrected. It, it does uh, serve. There's a, there's a warehouse. I don't know if we get to an aerial. There's a warehouse immediately uh, west of this parcel. There are several because... Parkway Corporate Center is there. There, so you can see that pond is part of the stormwater system for the warehousing and park, um, Parkway Corporate Center there to the west, but will also be permitted to serve the two buildings that are proposed. You won't need additional stormwater, or has that not been figured yet? We, for we'll the site for we'll the modify concern. the permit to uh, include the additional stormwater management. Was it designed to anticipate these buildings? Has not figured out the Right. So we will we will have to modify the existing swift mud um, permit to to do whatever add whatever stormwater management is necessary to accommodate these two buildings. I have a comment or question from the board. Um, just a couple um, in terms of that that drainage pond there in the southwest corner. Is there an easement that grants the rights for that water to go or to, to basically serve the, the um, industrial to the west? Uh, is there an entitlement in place that allows that drainage to 
uh, or is that handled through the through the swift mud permit? Um, I hope so, because I handled that warehouse there to the west. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I was wise enough to make sure there's an easement in place. I don't know it for a fact, but they we did they did a pretty good job of accommodating the master stormwater system. So I I would assume that's in place, and I'll provide that information to you before the next hearing. Perfect. And then uh, we did receive a comment um, from a resident in Lakeside Preserve concerned about the aesthetics and the buffering uh, as it relates to the neighborhood to the to the east. And so that's something that, uh, you know, based on the, the current proposed layout, I think it's, it would address that comment, but it's something we want to make sure that we continue to keep in, keep in the forefront related to the neighborhoods, um, you know, to the north, south, and, and east. I would suggest um, when you get the survey and this moves forward a little bit more, it looks like there is a natural vegetation buffer along that if we could keep what's good and kind of get rid of some of the junk and just kind of make that because the neighbors are used to that yeah. and I don't think it'll impact your site plan at all. And I agree when, when that aerial is up that does look like a natural yeah. buffer to keep in place. Um, we, we aren't across from the residential community we're across from that church facility but still from an aesthetic purpose um, perspective that would be appropriate. So we'll we'll report further on that to staff too in the interim before your final hearing. Comments from the board. Any comments from the audience? Public comment. And we will be, you will be back to talk to us again on soon. We'll see you next month. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take Item. everything. Oh, we'll we'll take you. everything we learned uh, today and uh, devise uh, uh, staff recommendations with conditions uh, at, for next month. Okay. Item number four. Change in zoning from I-2 medium industrial and LD limited development and a major modification of existing PUD zoning to allow an 820,300 square foot warehouse distribution center on approximately 66.68 .68 acres, generally located west of Airport Road and north of Drainfield Road. Owner Woods Family Management, LLC. Applicant, Jim Studial. Good morning again for the record, Philip Scarce, Principal Planner with Community Economic Development. Uh, this is the, um, a PUD modification um, at, uh, for approximately five acres, uh, five parcels totaling 66 acres. It's located on Airport Road, um, just north of uh, Drainfield, so get your bearing straight. This is Drainfield, this is Airport. And what this is, is we have uh, some I-2 zoning. This is um, commonly used as the Pops Painting Facility. Um, so Pops Painting has this facility here, which is zoned I-2, and portions of the property have a PUD designation. <coughs> Excuse me. And then uh, there is a, a limited development um, portion of the site, uh, about 25 acres, um, that's going to remain basically undeveloped and I'll let the applicant get get to that but uh, what they want to do is they want to combine uh, this so we're, so we're modifying PUD 5663 to include these uh, these four uh, parcels here well, if, um, uh, to combine all five parcels excuse me for the 66 acres to one overall PUD allowing a 820,000 uh, 300 square foot um, warehouse facility To the north here, this was uh, this is part of. Uh, you can see to the north and to the um, to the west. This is uh, Carillon Lakes development. Uh, this um, uh, piece right here was that uh, multifamily uh, development that was heard uh, a couple years ago, um, and they are actually in for site plan approval uh, right now for the multifamily. That's part of the uh, Carillon Lakes. And you can see Carillon Lakes right here, and then the site is right here. So this is the overall proposed uh, site plan. Existing POPs painting facility, main facility is here with access off a of Drainfield Road. And then there is uh, where the actual um, industrial building is. Uh, well, they're going to see a lot of slides today regarding this. 
this uh, storage area, because there's a little office. There's a um, there's an entrance here off an airport road. They have like their shipping and receiving office uh, here. And then there's just a lot of storage of equipment and things that, that we'll show you here in a second. Uh, but this is the, all the POPs painting facility will go away and it will be left with this 800,000 square foot uh, warehouse. So this is looking uh, northwest from uh, Airport Commerce Drive, uh, looking at, into uh, the POPs painting facility. This is looking west from Airport Road uh, into their uh, into their facility. Again, they have like a, a small shipping and receiving office back here. And this is just looking north on Airport Road. Um, they have some uh, light industrial uh, businesses um, across the road. This is um, oh, I forgot the name of this road. I apologize. Easy Drive. D, what's that? DMG. DMG Drive. Yeah, that's right. That's right. DMG Drive. So you have the DMG, DMG like a little industrial park uh, on uh, on the east. Okay, so this is looking uh, into the site where I mentioned there was a lot of storage. So this will be looking uh, uh, northwest. And this is looking west onto the site. This is a tree line. Um, uh, this is the boundary of their site. That LD portion um, is this tree line, which goes back further. Again, that's 25 acres. It goes back further. So there's considerable buffer between uh, that, that LD area uh, that's currently uh, will act uh, from that multifamily that's uh, under review now. You can see that. Uh, I just wanted to leave you with this overall site plan again uh, without any uh, lines or anything. Again, you have Pop's painting facility here. Uh, with his, uh, with the storage uh, facility here. Uh, when I was taking pictures, that tree line that you just saw is right here. Um, and, and again, uh, with the site plan, should I have one there? With the, you know, so with the site plan, this LD area that's currently zoned LD is gonna, that's gonna act as a natural buffer um, with, the, with, the, uh, with the multifamily to the north. Um, with that, I'm going to leave it over to the applicant. He's got some uh, slide presentation uh, as well, and I'm going to change over and let the applicant uh, come up and speak. Thank you, Phil. Jim Studial, for the record, and it's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate all of you serving in, in the role that you do. I know it's not an easy job. Um, I'm qualified and in good standing with the American Institute of Certified Planners. Um, and with me today is Jason Allegood of Kimley Horn, a professional engineer. Um, we have a lot of experience in doing zoning and, and planning and engineering for a project like this. Um, this is an existing PUD. Uh, our client is the Woods Family Partnership. They've been out here. They've been in business since 72. They've been out at this site since very early 90s. And the site is industrial zoned. Uh, I don't want anyone to think we're trying to change something dramatically. It's an industrial zone site and a PUD zone site uh, that now is being um, consolidated for a couple of uses. Let me be clear, P Pops Painting, and Mark Woods is with us today, um, will shrink and may still do some related operations because his son is intending to take the business off site, but they're not sure They've had a couple of industrial suitors who want to buy this property put up to the amount of square footage we've asked for on the parcel as shown on the site plan. But Mark has a, well, I should go through the slides and I'll show you the office building, what have you. Let me make sure we go forward. Yeah. And uh, Phil did a good job of kind of presenting the thing. Uh, this is from the airport road property. Um, he showed this intersection from DMG Drive. It's a natural, uh, we see this as a median access. We've been talking with Chuck a lot about this and the site plan accommodates it. Um, getting into the site, there's a lot of lay down, a lot of heavy equipment. This site, Pops Painting, has painted everything from the spires on Hard Rock Stadium where the dolphins play to the pieces of the Citrus Bowl Stadium and bridges and all sorts of large metal uh, pieces that come to the site, <clears throat> typically via truck, get painted and get taken back. Some of their painting is off-site, 
but as the years go on, there's a lot of stuff that has been here and been painted all over for, for delivery all over the state. Um, you start seeing the large assembly buildings that have gantries, if you will, uh, in the middle of the site. And as you get south a little further, you see some more buildings and the fuel operations uh, for, the, for the whole um, business. As you get all the way south to Airport Road, you notice things have changed. There's a tr oak tree line, which I'm sure Mr. Woods has planted over the years, and you're looking through a parking lot here um, that goes at the back of that parking lot. It serves a small office building where I've been a number of times, um, and I'll tell the story a little bit, but I got to know Mark Woods years ago when there were complaints from Carillon Lakes that they smelled the paint. And maybe there was paint overspray. So when we were out there, I got to know Mr. Woods, and there really wasn't a big problem. There was a perception of a problem. It had been called to code enforcement. We went out there to resolve it. And at that time, well, let me see if I can show it. Um, Mark was always upgrading the operation. It was a growing, booming operation. But his office became in this modern office building. And he intends to keep two small warehouses that are on the south side of the property near Drain Field. And there may still be some operation in there of his business, depending on what his son does. But the great bulk of the property and everything closer to Carillon Lakes will go over to a less heavy industrial use, as is uh, modern day warehousing. So let me try to follow my notes instead of jumping around. As you leave the site um, from its second entry, the site is well served access wise. You see the airport tower behind the modern warehouse on the far side. Um, as I did, staff did a good job of describing it. As you get out of the site, you see on the left the typical big warehouses that are one story but as tall as 38 feet. That's what we're also asking for. And there's the new 7-Eleven going up right on the corner of, of what was formerly Marco Bay property. So that kind of takes you through the site, what is there. And just being frank, it's a heavy industrial operation with a lot of lay down area. Most of that's going to go away and it's going to all go back to that modern office building and a small warehouse. Mr. Woods intends to keep eight acres of what I thought was like 62 total acres and sell the rest. He's had two or three players who have been making offers and one had started this case and then dropped back and we still have <clears throat> quite a bit of interest from them and, and two others. So we'll make the sale at some point, but he'll continue to operate on the south side, very near Drainfield Road. He has uses like that next to him, the fan shop, uh, heavy industrial uses along the edge, but mostly this is going over to be a much cleaner warehouse use with, uh, with new site improvements. Let me let Jason come up and do a few slides. Good morning, Jason Alligo with Kill Me Horn Associates. Uh, I'll walk a little bit through a summary of the engineering analysis we've done uh, with one of the most recent uh, potential developers on this site. So we are looking at approximately 120,000 square foot building, uh, looking at the fact that there was mostly industrial zoning um, with that LD on the north side. Uh, we worked with the city uh, to come up with a plan that kind of kept distance from the Carillon and the future multifamily development. So the, the LD portion made sense uh, to put retention up there in order to get this our warehouse square foot is it's, you know, economically viable. Um, that was the, the most common sense area for us to do that. So we've uh, situated our uh, development for that purpose. In addition, um, the previous developer that we worked with um, looked at access points uh, very closely. We worked with both the county and the city on as far as how we access, where we access, how we limit uh, interaction between uh, the remaining POPs uh, development when they stay in business and the new one comes online. And um, for the most part, uh, our stormwater is designed to, you can see on there, I don't know if there's some, a button there, but there's some blue lines to their site. That's some wet, some uh, floodplain that we have to deal with also in our stormwater. So this site's developed 
and designed to um, handle the 100 year storm water plus the compensation that's needed for that too. So um, we do have some preservation and conservation area um, that Jim will talk a little bit more in detail, but that we have um, for maintaining those buffers. Um, there is that covenant there on the preservation portion, uh, which is you know, relative to the Carillon's view as well. Uh, looking at our access points, we've got one across from number two there, across from D and G, and number three off of Drainfield. Uh, those are our larger entrances there. The number two is our shared, and then entrance number one, a little further north, which is for based off of spacing um, from DMG, would allow additional trucks. So we're distributing our traffic as much as we can throughout the area uh, to limit one access point. And there's just kind of a close up of our intended design for those access points there. Uh, as far as what the buildings look like, this might be an example. This is just you know, a couple examples of what the latest uh, developer was proposing, at least they've some of their standard buildings. So just from a standpoint of what it might look like and some of the ideas there. I'm not an architect, so I can't speak intelligently about those things, but I think it's a nice looking structure. So um, Jim will come up now and talk a little more about the preservation and conservation, and then we'll stand more for any kind of engineering questions that you do have at that time. Yeah, as I said earlier, I, I met Mark years ago when there was a little bit of heat. And what Mark did at that time was tell the residents he would leave this two acre, approximately two acre area tree because it's a great natural buffer. If you go out there, I've walked it and it's oak trees that are about very mature, 40 feet high with the whole forest coming up under it. I've stood in the backyard on the other side and looked at this and you know, we worried about view lines. We were gonna do an illustration, but we quickly realized that with the size of those oaks and the size of the warehouse, you're not gonna see anything. There's no sight lines from Carillon Lakes and the distance is substantial. So that area has been put in a preservation category with a restrictive covenant back years ago. Mark didn't have to do that, but he was interested in being a good neighbor. So he did that and essentially uh, gave up that land, which, uh, um, for, for any development, which cost him some money, but made him a good neighbor to the residents to the north. Um, the other areas, this wetland area will be utilized. You see the area is 750 feet. We're very aware of, of that area and the new multifamily. I think Tim's here who represented that group. And we got a, a handle of that multifamily site plan that's going through review now and we wanted to minimize views. So we've put in, Mark has committed, the owner has committed to, and of course the developer will develop this uh, double tree line at the north edge of our property to create an additional visual buffer. It's a long way and they're just looking across a lake or a wetland like it is now, but we wanted to be sure we were uh, creating the greatest buffers we could. So we did that. Um, as proposed in the site plan. We think of that as oaks and pines in between on 25 foot centers. So 50 foot on oaks and 25 in between each one. Um, in summary, um, this is a modification of a heavier industrial use to a medium industrial use on the bulk of the property. It is uh, got a better traffic profile because it is truck traffic, but it's far less traffic than would be if it was office or commercial or multifamily or any of those uses. It thirdly has site characteristics that fit the large scale warehouse and is consistent with similar large scale warehouses that are everywhere in that area. There is booming, good or bad. That's something we intended when we annexed all this, all this land. And we've done our best to buffer it well from the adjacent residential uses that occur that I just went over. With that, I'll stop and we will answer any questions that you might have and we ask for the uh, ability to come back up and address anything that people bring up that uh, we might be able to clarify on. Thank you. Any questions from the board? I have a quick question about the retention area. Is that going to be wet retention or dry retention? It's wet. 
I have questions or comments. Um, I, I do. Um, and whoever purchases that property, because you mentioned people wanting to purchase it, those two green spaces that you um, parceled out, they're going to transfer to whoever purchases that. That's parcel. the intent. But there is a cons there is a restrictive easement over that preservation area. Now the conservation areas on the other side are going to be reworked, but those will remain. We'll be subject to that site plan requirement. Uh, if we were to change anything once this is approved, we'd have to come in and ask for it. But that tree preservation area between us and Carillon Lakes is already, it was set back, you know, I was director. I remember thinking Mark didn't have to do that, but he, he did, and he's, it, you know, he's just left it alone. It's at the back corner of his property, so. Any other questions or comments from the board? Is there any frontage on uh, airport preserve there, for any widening or anything of that nature? That's a good question. Um, I know we're reviewing the traffic study now, and that's one of the concerns that, that I have is, is that under the background conditions with everything that's happening in that area, we are seeing some level of service failures at intersections, including Carillon Boulevard and, and Airport Road, as well as Drainfield and Airport. So one of the things we've talked about is, is how do we get additional, you know, room for a southbound lane to be able to go through the intersection at Carillon and Publix's headquarters to be able to carry traffic down to this facility. The other thing is, is the roadway does get very constrained as you get down towards the 7-Eleven and ultimately Drainfield. So that's one of the things that we need to look at kind of as part of an overall kind of mitigation strategy is, is how do we do that. The other issue too is, is that DOT, um, you know, of course Airport Road is the DOT road and so we need to continue to work with them to get them uh, a comfort level that a full access point at the main entrance opposite DMG Drive to support a future signalized intersection will work with their permitting staff as well. There, there's been quite a bit of recent history related to the um, 7-Eleven driveway, which has been kind of modified now. It comes up north of the 7-Eleven site. And so kind of what we've heard initially is, is that that would preclude a full access at DM, you know, opposite GMG Drive, which is a concern of city staff. Certainly, we believe that it makes more sense to consolidate the larger uh, turning movements and, and traffic to one location approximately halfway between Drainfield and Carillon. I mean, it's just really kind of, in my mind, basic access management. And so we still need to have those conversations with DOT. And uh, of course, Polk County will be the permitting authority related to the Drainfield Road connection. But uh, what we've heard initially is they don't, have, they don't have concerns about that. They also have concerns about the operations of Drainfield Airport Road. And, and so those are things that we need to look at you know, going forward. <clears throat> I think one of my questions too is kind of get a better handle of what the existing traffic is right now with the existing POTS painting operation relative to this use. And that can help us too be able to take a look at what that actual increment is and, and kind of work that into our mitigation discussion as well. Yeah, well, we can do that as we continue to develop, you know, and finalize the site plan. Any other questions? Uh, so, you. Just to confirm, this is going from, a, I guess, a portion of it's a PUD, but actually changing the full scope to medium industrial for the entire site. Yeah, and the land use has been industrial. It, land use doesn't change. Okay. What we're doing is customizing the zoning to accommodate the warehouse. But we want to point out, Mr. Woods made it clear to me, that that front area, he may still um, manage some of this POPs operation as the other one moves. It will stay till it moves, and then it may still be somewhat accommodated on this site, but it would be inside in those two smaller warehouses way down on Drain Field. So, but it would all be specified in the PUD. So it'll have a custom PUD that covers the whole property instead of the general medium industrial that accommodated POPs, but also accommodated a PUD next to it. Actually, Pops was under the PUD uh, as we annexed and zoned all this property many years ago. Yeah, just for the digital background, um, Pops spending was annexed in from the county, so it was already established in the county. And when it was brought in, it was given an um, ITU, which is medium industrial, uh, but it's really more of an I3 use, so it's technically a legal non-conforming use. Um, they cannot currently expand in under the PUD, it will remain as such. So. 
Uh, eventually, we um, expect that we'll transition away um, from that, but that's its current status. Yeah, the comments, questions, and, and, and just one more question or request for Mr. Studial is there's the, uh, the darker the darker line that's shown on the exhibit there along the western side, kind of the northwestern quadrant of the of the, the site, um, that the uh, a buffer wall or any kind of other noise abatement feature that would also help provide additional um, uh, sound abatement relative to the site in Caroline Lakes. Yeah, when we had the warehouse closer, if you remember when we were first working with Stoughton, they had the warehouse over, and they were disturbing those that area. <laughs> And when we pointed out to them, you can't disturb it, you gotta move the warehouse, the warehouse shrunk. So at that point, we were talking about a uh, wall uh, and we really haven't discussed it very much since, but we can certainly look at that with staff and figure out what's the best treatment there. It may, it may be vegetative, it may be structural, but we're, we're happy to sit down with you and figure that out. Anyone else? Yeah, our sensitivity was to Carillon Lakes, really, because we're well aware of them, and they've been our neighbors for a long time. We were there first, and we saw, you know, as Mark says, we saw them digging the lakes for the parkway from Carillon Lakes. But in fact, um, um, we've moved over a little bit, shrunk the warehouse, and tried to accommodate them. And uh, Mark reminded us, hey, I set that land aside. I, I, I want, want to continue to... Uh, honor that restrictive easement that's on the land. So we have. So just to be clear, most of the truck traffic will use Airport Road and not the access point at Drainfield? Very likely, yes ma'am. Any other questions or comments? Any comments or questions? In the audience. Any any public comment on this one? And um, sorry for the record. Um, again, Phillips Garrett's community economic development. Um, as uh, you know, this was this was advertised and, and mailers were sent out. Uh, we did not receive any emails or phone calls and objections. Okay. You all will be back next month. After you. Correct. Okay. We'll be back next month with our recommendation. Oh, Sorry, my name's Russell Delaney. I live in Caroline Lakes uh, in one of the buildings that, uh, homes that butts up to the community. Address, Pardon me? Your address. I'm a resident. Your address? Your address. Oh, 3386 Songbird Lane. Thank you. That preservation area that was in the green is going to be very important. Um, it's hard to see in a satellite map, but there's a nature trail that kind of goes along that uh, brown edge, which is wet as well, even though it doesn't show as part of the lake. Um, there's a drainage spot for that lake that's designed for flooding and so on, but this lake is also fed by other lakes in the community. And they spill off <coughs> over to this lake, and then that drainage, if it ever gets to that point, um, will drain to a river along that easement all the way out to um, air, uh, Drainfield Road. So that preservation area is kind of really important to us, not just from the noise factor and all of that, but because of any possible flooding or anything that could occur in that area. So, um, but at least as far as from where we're at, as far as the noise factor and all that, of course, you know, we're, we weren't really happy about the whole apartment situation, but that buffer zone between those two, as well as that preservation area, really important. That's it. That existing hydrology, once again for the record, Jim Studiali, um, that existing hydrology is to remain. It's going to be, you know, further accommodated with the retention area, but that is the creek by which uh, water conveys southerly 
to that whole system, uh, and it will continue to be that. That's that's what's going on. All right. Any other comments from the public? Questions from the board? Thank you. We'll see you again. Item five, large scale land use amendment to allow a change in future land use from residential medium to residential low on approximately 19.02 acres and from residential medium to residential high on approximately 59.22 acres and a major modification of PUD zoning to allow for the redevelopment of the former Wedgwood Golf Course for 874 multifamily dwelling units, 60 single-family attached townhome dwelling units, and 60 single-family detached dwelling units on 127.89 acres generally located north of Interstate 4, south of Heather Point Drive, east and west of Carpenter's Way, and south of Wedgwood Estates Boulevard, 401 <coughs> Carpenter's Way. Owner, SJD Development, LLC. Applicant, Jonathan Hall, SJD Development, LLC. And this is the consideration of a final decision. Okay, for this um, item, there's a continuance. Um, we would ask the applicant to come forward and um, summarize the ch changes that were done in response to last month's meeting. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. I wasn't here last time. I'm going through some chemo and kind of messing me up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can. Very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning, uh, commissioners. For the record, uh, Bart Allen, land use attorney with the Peterson and Myers Law Firm. My address is 225 East Lemon Street, Lakeland, Florida. I'm here on behalf of the applicant this morning, SJD Development. With me, I have Mr. Jonathan Hall. <coughs> Uh, who is representing the property owner and applicant. I also have with me, um, there you go, perfect, thank you, Philip. Uh, Mr. Scott Minganay from Kimley Horn. Also have Mr. James Taylor uh, from Kimley Horn and Mark Wilson. You're gonna hear, we're gonna be a little bit briefer than we were last time, I hope. Um, we're gonna focus very much on the changes that we went, that were made from last hearing to this hearing. I'll touch just briefly on kind of how the process has gone along the way as well. But the, the intent here is to be very deliberate and concise related to kind of how we concluded um, September's Planning Commission hearing and the changes that uh, resulted from that. Thank you, Phil. Again, briefly, just a really quick overview of the entire process. As you, as you recall, we were before you in May of 2022, came through with the, with the overall project. And at that time, it was a mix of townhomes, multifamily, and single family development, total over, as well as an ALF. Total overall unit count at that time was a little over 1,400 units in total. Um, came back and had some additional meetings. We had a continuance of that, or moved to the second phase of the public hearing process, had some additional meetings with the residents, came back before you in August, uh, September, after we had resubmitted in August, reduced the overall unit count, removed the ALF, had dropped it to basically a multifamily, single family uh, project with an overall unit count of about 1,200 total units. When we concluded last time, we were really talking in, in September, we were talking about a couple different primary issues, and some of it related to compatibility, and I'll, I'll refer to those into the kind of the bulk and the scale of the size of some of the buildings, particularly in relation to the townhome at Sand Wedge and Fairfield, but also we were talking a lot about transportation. So the primary focus this morning that we're going to hit on are how we change the site plan, how we've changed the unit mix, because now we've, again, Drop the unit count to go from that 1,200 number. Now we're 994. 
We've reduced it significantly. That's over 200 units out of the project. Um, we've added back in the townhome component. Listen Again, listening to the conversation that we were having here about adding a different product type and making sure that you know we're having similar products adjacent to similar products and also trying to be extremely um, conscious of the neighborhood, the community, and trying to make it overall feel, feel right. Next slide. We can just skip through the next couple. These are just some of the old slides. Keep going, Philip. I'll let you know when to stop. We, we kept all of this in the slide deck. That's about 50 slides, but we wanted to have it in case we needed to keep uh, to come back to reference. Keep going. Uh, this was the site plan that we submitted in August. Um, this was the one that we reviewed in uh, at your September hearing. As you'll recall, we had single fam we had reduced a single family here. We had gone to the multifamily throughout. Uh, we had adjusted the single fa to single family in holes around tracks five, six, and seven, as well as removed the ALF, realigned the road, and then we stayed with the multifamily in tract eight. Moving forward, and I'll have Scott go through the details of this, but we'll show you we've maintained the consistency of our, what we call hole one or track one related to Heather Point, uh, similar lot sizes, similar lot design. We've adjusted building heights within hole two. Uh, we've reduced building heights within um, hole 10 and 11 to go down to two story. They're still multifamily, but they are now down to two story uh, building heights within this area. Basically, track three will remain the same. Holes five, six, and seven remain unchanged from uh, effectively September. And we have reduced, modified this from the multifamily to the townhome concept in, in this area, two story. Uh, it really just works better from a uh, parking and overall site design and ability to accommodate the development as well as stormwater and all the other things um, in there. I'm going to ask Scott, uh, next slide, Philip. Scott to come up and give you the details, show you how all this works and how it nets out. And when Scott's done, I'm going to ask Mr. Taylor to address the transportation concerns. And then I have just a couple last minute comments uh, as it relates to some last minute changes, um, tweaks, if you will, that we're um, making to the site plan. So, Scott. No, that, that, that's okay. Man. Scott Mingane, Kimberly Horn, uh, thank you for uh, <clears throat> diligently uh, surviving with us through this process, too. We'll try to be brief. Uh, just wanted to give you the whole by, uh, the parcel by parcel comparison really quickly with some enlargements at a glance. So uh, parcel one, again, uh, remains unchanged. It's 14 units within that single family area, 90 foot wide similarly depths that would accommodate a similar depth uh, to Heather Point. So we really haven't changed anything there and we've outlined what that is with all of those being 90 foot wide lots. Parcel, uh, parcel two is really highlighted there. I don't know if you can see those. I think you should be able to on that list. We've highlighted where we've removed two D, E, and F down to three stories. So D, E, and F were originally, <clears throat> you know, kind of we had them framed here we pulled them into the middle of the site. And since we reduced them from four story to three story, we also took an opportunity to kind of turn their sides uh, because we had reduced parking. So we turned the sides toward uh, Audubon Oaks so that the buildings weren't kind of creating an, a, a more of a mass and created these paseos in between like G and F. You've got landscape area and then between E and D, a landscape area with some smaller connected areas. We removed the parking further from the edges and then enhanced the, the buffers on the ends. So hopefully you get these sight lines through from Audubon so you're not seeing necessarily the building but also the space between those. So we think that the reduced height and the reduction of parking allow us to do that for an overall reduction of 30 units. Uh, next couple of parcels you can kind of look at. Parcel three, again, uh, no change necessarily, just as a highlight. Parcel, parcel three was really mainly along Lakeland Park Drive, <clears throat> along that set side of the, uh, the, of the project. And then 4, 10, and 11 was really in the center 
of the site. And mainly we wanted to highlight where we went from three story uh, after a lot of discussion uh, with the board and the community, remove those down all the way, uh, all of those sites uh, in parcel 10 down to two story. We left 4G right here, but the, there are no units here and we're close to 200 feet separation between the closest building on that site there. We did reduce it uh, down in this previous one and we've still kind of got that mainly area. So 11C did get reduced in height and uh, scale and then uh, the, the main density was remained here in the corner. So for an overall reduction of 50 units within that 4, 10, 11 center zone of the site. And then likewise, any parking changes in each of those parcels would be reduced likewise to create more open space, more planting, more buffer, and everything else. Uh, no, no changes in parcels five, six, and seven per our last presentation. And again, all of those are 60 foot wide lots. And generally, based on the configuration of the site, uh, we haven't lotted them out because we haven't done mass grading and engineering and stormwater on some of those things, but we feel very confident not only to be able to accommodate the buffers uh, in, in each of these areas, but we feel that we can get 110, over 110 foot depth even along these edges to make sure that those, those are similar size of single family residences that could be built and constructed in that. And we've also proffered up a little bit deeper front and rear setbacks and still have had conversations with developers that says, okay, yes, I can do a, a constructible, buildable footprint that will be marketable in this area for single family homes. Parcel 9, I'll skip back to 8, but Parcel 9, again, no change. It's the same as presented uh, back in September. And then Parcel 8, really there was a, uh, some concerns from staff, even just could we park with that much density? And we heard a lot from your, from both the residents and from uh, Council and Commission on, on you know, the density and like versus like product. So we have gone to a townhome product all along here from the three and four story density, even though this is uh, currently in RH, residential high, we have lowered that density to uh, 60 units here uh, with varying sizes of townhome units. And you can see that listing of each of the sizes of the townhomes for an overall reduction of 134 units all within that area. And I've got an exhibit for the buffers along that area. And so when we get there, you'll notice that we have a type C buffer and based on concerns or to alleviate any other concerns, not only will we do the type C buffer, but if we need to add a fence, we are prepared to do that. Obviously that would be worked out during the site plan process, but, but we would be willing to do add a fence to that type C buffer along that area. Uh, again, we've highlighted, we, we've, we have removed one of the clubhouse amenity areas within this townhome area, but we have highlighted again where those three community facilities are within 4, 10, and 11, parcel 3, and parcel 2. That's really unchanged. I'm just highlighting it for uh, interest and in, in conversation as we had last time. Overall densities uh, from previous in May next have been greatly reduced. Uh, through August, we got it down even to 10.45 dwelling units for the overall development below that residential medium. And now, currently, overall, if you next slide, we're down to 8.6 dwelling units per acre with these current reductions uh, that we've gone to a total unit count of 994. So significantly reduced from the 1208 or so that we were at prior in September. I'll, this just gives you an overall summary of where we were and what we had done before. Overall compatibility uh, you know, within the area of dwelling units per acre. Quickly, I don't need to re rehash this. You have this in your, in your packet and it's consistent. Next couple of slides, if you'll. Um, these are the same single family images. Next one. Uh, we did add back in to the townhome parcels where you can see that highlighted in eight. We've highlighted where those townhomes would be going and gave you some representative character styles. Uh, this image was of a clubhouse and of the pool and amenity space. That is a higher multifamily material. That is not the, a precedent image. We were using it based on ponds and walkability and connectivity. 
uh, but what you'd see is more of a front-loaded or rear, <clears throat> a front-loaded or rear-loaded unit, uh, and then just some other character shots that would be consistent with the townhome community. And that has been added back in. That was back in May. That was in there, and so we've kind of gone back and forth. Next one, and then this is the same consistent slide that you saw. Just the image, the character, the architecture that will work closely with you in the community as we design those projects. Nothing has really been designed, but I'll state it again that we are using a prototype that works well. Uh, with uh, cost feasibility. We know that we have developers that can produce this project and architects that can produce similar uh, schemes and character and color variations on those prototype buildings, but still uh, work with the overall development. Next. Uh, one point, uh, this is the same slides, the same street site circulation. I didn't update this graphic because it's just a street within the overall development. So this master plan really uh, hasn't been updated behind it, but all the streets cross sections do remain the same. And then one point I will outline, we had had this overall pedestrian circulation highlighted by the Orange Pass, which are basically, again, the, a, a new and improved uh, golf course pass that we aren't going to be, you know, using those old golf cars pass, but we're using where those golf cart pass entered and exited the communities with the exception of the loop. We are, uh, there were some concerns about this crossing through the loop, so we're willing to take that out of that and then just have it internal uh, to this without that crossing. Uh, so we've left it on, uh, as we think it's an, uh, an added benefit to create an entire connected uh, pedestrian, but according to the to loop, then we, we are willing to, to remove that uh, section out of there. Again, the cross sections are, are exactly what you've seen prior. Where we do have a three and four story, we have that center spine road, and mainly we're just highlighting the, the volume, the space, the people places that we're trying to create with good, sufficient landscape, 10 to 15 feet, but a good multi-use trail with separation, on-street uh, parking, the two travel lanes, and then still a sufficient sidewalk with separate landscape. Uh, to create, uh, again, a, a walkable uh, neighborhood for both residents and uh, non-residents alike. Uh, and these are the same, uh, again, just to highlight this trail uh, access and really a public access that would be maintained by the HOA um, for the entire community. And here's the buffers that we had talked about in this one area. They all stay the same with the added of buffer C. You can see it's the purple there. We would add a fence to that if it's uh, necessary. Uh, and certainly, again, the master plan has not been updated behind that graphic, but this is the townhome section and added buffer C with that fence. And you'll see those cross sections. There's A, and this is also in your packet as a part of the staff's report as well. Next. <clears throat> and you can see that buffer C, and then what we would do is just add a fence for extra screening and buffering. Excuse me, I, my, my voice seems to be giving away. I must be done. <laughs> if you have any other questions, we'll address them. I have a question. Okay. I'm going to ask Mr. Taylor, do you have any questions with, uh, of Scott before he sits down? No question. Good morning, James Taylor with Kimberly Horn Associates, 189 South Orange Avenue, Orlando, Florida. Uh, I'm the traffic engineer for the project. And what we, some of the feedback that we received from the last PNZ was regarding traffic. So we wanted to do a little bit more robust job of presenting what we've done and also talk about some of the changes since the last presentation. So the purpose of the, the traffic impact study that kind of uh, guides us through this process and making sure that we abide by all code requirements. Uh, the reason we do it is to really assess the impacts of the potential of changing the future land use in the Comprehensive Plan Amendment, and then also looking uh, at a zoomed in version of what is being proposed in the PD4, operational conditions at study area intersections and driveways, uh, to identify those deficiencies <coughs> and which of those deficiencies are, are project impacts. The methodology that we abide by is in accordance with the city's LDC and also with Polk County TPO methodology who uh, will review this site for any um, county permits. In coordination with your staff, we, we've kind of met early and often on this project. I, I recall at least three back and forth with comment response on the methodology alone 
phone calls, and then after the study submitted, uh, another sit down comment response periods with the, with the staff, and, and we're at a point now where all those comments have been addressed. The conclusions of the TIS, that's the traffic impact study, were that the comprehensive plan actually cumulatively reduces the trip generation potential uh, of, the, of what could occur with the future land use. All the study roadway segments operate within the adopted capacity. There are existing deficiencies for the intersections, especially along US 98, that are really a function of how DOT times those signals. So the, the DOT will want to prioritize the mainline traffic where most of the volume is, is making through movements north and south. But at the minor approaches, what that does is it takes away green time from those folks. And out there today, if, if you're at one of those minor approaches, you will sit a while. And what we, what we, how we quantify that is through level of service. And some of those minor approaches are a level of service F today. So we wanted to kind of go through all the things that we've identified as improvements that this project is going to make to transportation and infrastructure. Um, the, the roundabout that was identified earlier in the report at Carpenters and Wedgwood Way, that's, a, that's an access management improvement. It takes two curb cuts and, or two, two intersections and turns it into one. Um, we have the multi-use trail that Scott touched upon the right-of-way dedication for the future extension of Lakeland Park Drive, should the city pursue that. Uh, we've, we've assisted staff with kind of identifying what the benefits would be to that extension. And that was kind of separate from the project impact. It was just a study that the staff asked us to perform and, and we provided that. Um, there will be coordination with the Citrus Connector for a transit stop potential on uh, Carpenter's Way, contribution to the Mass Transit District, payment to, um, to the city in the form of transportation impact fees. And then uh, the last bullet isn't really a transportation uh, improvement, but it, it's kind of related, the sanitary sewer station upgrades and the force main expansion. So some of the things that we heard at the last hearing were really focused in on Carpenter's Way and what the local residents experience out there today in the form of congestion. And we wanted to really zoom in on that area and quantify that for the board. Um, one of the comments we received was, you're not analyzing the right true peak hour of traffic. So we conducted a 24 hour tube count at Carpenter's Way just to identify when is the peak time for volume. And that graph shows that the peak time is occurring between 4.45 PM and 5.45 PM. And as a part of these studies, we typically analyze the highest hour between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. So just to make sure that we are analyzing the true peak hour, we, we conducted that count and found that we are. Um, during the peak time, the capacity on the, the roadway segment capacity for Carpenter's Way, today, if you look in the, the TPO's spreadsheet that they annually update for capacity, they're showing that V over C, so this is the, the peak hour roadway volume divided by the capacity of the road. So if you're over one, you're over capacity, and if you're under one, you're not. They're reporting that the capacity performance on Carpenter's Way is currently a 0 0.3 to 0 0.32. Um, we went out there after the Lakeland Park Drive extension was connected, and we we redid that count and we found that that is probably closer to 0.71 um, based on counts that we did recently after that was open. So 0.71 is meaning that your, your traffic out there today is taking up about 71% of the capacity of the road. So there's about 29% more until you're exceeding the uh, accepted level of service for that roadway. Um, with the background or with the project traffic added to that and build out of 2025, we anticipate that that will go from 0.71 to 0.85. So still within the realm of the acceptable level of service for that roadway. And specifically that's identified as a roadway or as a level of service of C. Um, level of service are kind of like letter grades. A is really good. F is your failing. C, we're right in the middle. Um, we also wanted to touch on kind of identifying the access management along Carpenter's Way and the build-out condition compared to what it is today. And access management is important because it, it, it identifies the number of conflict points along a segment of roadway for the potential, potential crashes. So on the left side of the screen, you see that the existing number of intersections, and this is 
you know, a, a curb cut on one side of the street, uh, at minimum, and potentially on both sides of the street, if you go out there and count them, there's eight of those today, eight intersections between, uh, well, as, as, as you kind of see here, we've identified each one of them from just south of Wedgwood Estates to just north of Lakeland Park Drive. In the future condition, once the roundabout is um, established, that reduces one intersection. Once the clubhouse is reduced from the two points that you see there on the left side at seven and eight down to one and repurposed for a residential driveway, uh, the future condition, is we're, we're, we end up at the same number of intersections. It's, it's eight today, it's gonna be eight in the future. So not a, a degradation in access management. Uh, and then we also identified turn lane needs. We heard some of the residents saying there's high delay times for uh, getting in and out of their drives. Um, there are no existing turn lanes out there today for that same segment of roadway. And based on future volumes, there are no new turn lanes required at the three new driveways that you see here. Um, what those numbers are identifying is the number of vehicles that are making that identified turn over the course of the PM peak hour. Uh, city code does not require uh, any turn lanes at this posted speed and combination of volumes. And specific to what does that feel like if you're a commuter trying to make a left turn off of Carpenter's Way into the site, and then how does that feel to the person behind you that has to wait for you to make that turn? We've identified all the left turns along Carpenter's Way are level service A. So that, that's the best grade you can get. It's a very low delay. There's lots of gaps available for folks to make the left turn so that the person behind them doesn't have to wait long at all. So overall takeaways from this zoomed in Carpenter's Way analysis is that Carpenter's Way is anticipated to operate at a level service C, that's a, that's a passing grade by your code, uh, during the PM peak hour at project build out. And the redevelopment is not gonna add additional intersections to the segment of Carpenter's Way. There are no turn lanes required by your code and the left turn movements and the folks behind them operate with very low delay times and acceptable level of service, in fact, the best, level of service A. And I'll be standing by for any questions, thank you. Any, any questions of Mr. Taylor while he's still standing? Uh, just two, um, or I guess one, really, you say no turn lanes are required based on city code of posted speed, is that right? Design or posted speed? Correct, the posted speed on the road is 25 miles per hour. Left turns aren't required by your code until you're at least 35, and then there's a, a volume uh, of, I believe it's 40 turns, plus in the combination with the 35 or greater that would trigger the need for left turn lanes. So just based on the speed alone, uh, no left turn lanes required. And the city anticipates this maintaining 25 out there? Yes. Okay. Early on, we discussed additional road construction that would take place over the next two to four years to build ease some of the traffic problems out there. Have all of those roads, has money been, been, been designated for the cost of, of uh, that construction yet, or is that still something the county and city have to address? That, that's something the city still has to address. And just kind of stepping back in terms of the history of the Lincoln Park Drive extension, um, the city started evaluating that area back about 2007 when Carpenter's Way was actually gated um, you know, within the Without Walls Church campus. And so we kind of had an uh-oh moment in terms of trying to provide circulation in, in the neighborhood. And so the city conducted a, uh, a, an overall corridor study that looked at the impacts of reopening that section of Carpenter's Way, as well as providing another route to be able to get from US 98 over to Circum Loop Road. We were receiving complaints in the Sandpiper area that they were not able to get to the mall and, and those retail establishments. And so we started to look at that in, in about 2011 or so. Carpenter's Way was, was reopened and reconstructed. Um, of course, the first phase of the Lincoln Park Drive Extension was rebuilt with the Dick's Sporting Goods Lincoln Park Center retail development in about 2013, 2014. And then the second phase was recently opened north of Carpenter's Way. The problem we always have had is, is that the area between Carpenter's Way and Union Drive, kind of towards the, towards the west, towards the shopping center, is that there's a Florida gas transmission uh, easement and a, and a uh, high pressure gas line that's in that area. 
that looking about 2014 or so, it was almost a $5 million cost to mitigate or relocate that gas line. So that was always seen as really a huge barrier in terms of completing that connection. With the conditions that we have proposed at this point and the dedication of the right-of-way for Lincoln Park Drive in this area, we believe that gets rid of a major impediment to being able to complete the connection back to US 98. Um, that leaves a couple of properties that we either need to renegotiate with or work through the normal right-of-way acquisition process to acquire, but it makes it a lot more feasible to be able to do something in a relatively short amount of time. Um, that leaves, you know, going back to your original question, you know, we still need right-of-way acquisition for those two, you know, uh, you know for those two, two properties as well as construction funding. Um, but that, that I think that in terms of getting the corridor uh, dedicated to the city, that is a huge benefit that makes this, make this other project uh, viable a lot, lot quicker. Thank you. Um, Initially, did, did you say something about part of the problem or part of the issue with traffic was because of the lack of good timing on 98 North? And that that's going to be looked into, I guess, by the county. That well, it would have to be something that DOT uh, DOT controls the timing of those lights, um, and they're going to prioritize the three thousand or so, you know, peak hour volumes on US ninety eight. That's kind of their their mission to protect their roadway and their through movements. Um, the, the city and the county can definitely advocate and, and ask DOT to look into doing some timing improvements uh, to make that work better. Um, but really, it's, it's up to DOT to, to, to abide by, you know, whatever, whatever their, so their mission is and their advocation from the city. So we really have nothing city-wise. We have no control over the exits coming out of Carpenter's Way on uh, on. Wedgwood Estates or further on down. We have no control over the... Correct. Something about that. Yeah, correct. I mean, and I, I have municipal clients, and I have done traffic studies to kind of show DOT that this could work better if you did these things. Mm -hmm. um, but really, at the end of the day, it's up to, up to DOT. Any other questions from the board? As I recall from our last meeting, uh, we had said, that while usually public comment is limited to the first meeting, I believe that our last meeting, since there were going to be a lot of changes presented today, that we would be allowing public comment a second time. That was my understanding as well. I think if we, you know, if there's public comment, I think to the extent that they're, you know, focused on the changes that we've made since last time and not a complete rehash, I don't, you know, I don't believe you know, we're in, in any way wanting to restrict due process and people having a, a voice. These these hearings are important. Um, I would ask that, you know, we we made very specific changes to the comments that were, you know, addressed last hearing. And if we could, to the extent we can, keep them focused on that, we'd be, you know, open, open to that process, if that would be the pleasure of the board. Um, before I sit down, I just want to make sure the record's clear. One, um, We've reviewed the staff report, and we're we're okay with the we are in agreement and support of the conditions of approval that are presented to you today. Uh, we believe the project is consistent with the comprehensive plan, the land use, and the PUD modification, and it is compatible uh, with the surrounding area. I have two minor things that I do have to change on the site plan, and that relates. Unfortunately, some of these changes came in after we had to resubmit to get in to um, this hearing, but we will be removing this piece of the pedestrian trail. That is in an easement. It goes across in the, the loop property. Uh, it's not something we control. We've talked with the loop. They prefer it not be there. We've agreed to that, so we're, we're gonna take that off and update the pedestrian circulation exhibit that is a part of the ordinance. Um, and then the other uh, one that I wanted to just mention, this is not the landscape exhibit, but we will be adding an offense into the um, buffer within Tract 8. That will be updated in the landscape exhibit as well. Those are a couple minor changes and minor additions that we're, we're doing um, to address our, our project compatibility and security. So. I guess I've got two questions before we go to public comment. Sure. Um, 
And they, they both came up last time, so I just want to make sure they were either addressed or omitted um, for a purpose. Uh, one is the maintenance of the trail. Who's, who's responsible? These will all, okay, that's the, a, and I totally meant that, uh, Commissioner Log, I meant to uh, get into that. Yes, each of these developments will have an HOA. The HOA will have the ownership and the maintenance obligation to maintain the um, trails. There will be, through those documents, we can create a network where if one HOA, let's say developer goes away, whatever the case may be, uh, and there's a bad actor, and I'm not suggesting that there would be, but we lawyers always have to worry about the, the, the worst case scenarios, right? That we can build into those HOAs cross uh, basically self-help provisions so that if HOA A is doing a poor job, HOA B can go over there and fix it for them and create, there'll be a process to go to get reimbursed for those costs. That will all be dealt with through the HOA documents and the HOA master planning and uh, master HOAs. So that's how that will be. They will all be maintained by the HOAs. Knowing this is going to be phased, I think you all had three phases initially. Um, the trails are going to be a part of the first phase uh, for, say, uh, track A. They'll, they'll be reconstructed as the phases develop. So if track, it was, you know, we've been talking about track date a lot today. If track date were to go first, and I'm not suggesting that's what's happening, but we would build our, that developer would build that piece and it would get built out as the development goes. So just so I understand, um, the entire trail network will not be complete until the entire, all phases are Correct. constructed. I would say that's, that's accurate. Mm. Mr. Lock, if I could just add one more piece of information. Uh, the reason is we tried to maintain where they penetrated the public right of way. So the current trail, the golf court path today, doesn't necessarily align with the multi-use trail will tomorrow, except for where it penetrates the public access point. So it would be hard for us to build that in a new condition without the development of that parcel because it would be, they'll be able to access the trail as it exists in those other parcels. But then when the new parcel comes online, then it will be rehabbed and then upgraded to new multi-use trail. Okay. Um, the last item, just doing some digging, there's a parcel that is not a part of this, that was a part of the original purchase of the land on the very south part of the parcel. So if you go to page 17 of your slideshow. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe it's not very, oh yes. So you can see where the right of way jogs. Uh, yeah, right there. Is there a reason that is not a part of this? I know. I, I don't I honestly don't have a good answer for that question. Give me two seconds. <laughs> it wasn't a conscious decision to exclude it for any particular reason. Um, I, I really asked because you, you for because of the right of way dedication. Correct. Um, I don't. I don't want to put the city in a situation where we're coming back that, a second time. Th that was not in any way an uh, an attempt to avoid with the right of way dedication at all. Um, I think it was probably more more or less an oversight than it was anything. Bart can blame me. Oh, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to blame anybody. <laughs> with the with the. With the resubmittal of the exhibit that takes out that section of the trail system through the loop, can that line? Hundred percent. We can incorporate that. We can move. We can bump that um, property line out and, and adjust the legal description appropriately. That's a minor, small piece. Any other questions for the applicant? Now we are going to allow some public any restrictions that you want to put open about. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I we are going to open it up to public comment now. Yeah. That was my understanding. Right. I, I think the applicant said that they were okay with it. They had the request that 
right. the comments be limited to the changes since there have been uh, many rounds of public comment on this item. That'll be up to you, Mr. Chair, to, to keep the comments on track. Well, I think, yeah, we'd like to as much as possible to see where there might be an exception here or there, but I think as much as possible it's a reasonable request. So we limit it so that we don't rehash what we've discussed previous meeting. And, and to the extent that, that there, there are additional questions, we would request a, an opportunity to address any public comments oh, as well, Mr. Chair. Is that be absolutely. Good? Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm entitled to three minutes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. That's all I'm asking for is three minutes. Absolutely. If you talk to the desk, we'll begin <clears throat> with you and we're you. My name is Jim Berg. I live at uh, 4120 Chelsea Lane for 17 years. I'm a state of Florida certified general contractor, so I know a little bit about this business. Now, you've heard a lot of legal talk today from the attorneys, but these are the, this, is, this is Paul Harvey, the rest of the story, please. Uh, we have a tremendous water drainage problem. Um, our subdivision is located in the green swamp of Gibsonia, Florida. It's a swampland. So water drainage is, is critical. Um, and the golf course um, takes care of that, the green grass, so the water can percolate without flooding the existing homes. Um, if you look at number four on my handout, the, 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 the effect of 1,500 automobiles in the morning and at night. Now he's talking about 0.71, some kind of a traffic thing. I wait five minutes at night. I wait five minutes in the morning to get on, uh, on onto Carpenter's Way, the way it is. Now when we employ, when we when we add an additional 1,500 units, I mean cars, cars because there's, there's 1,100 units and I figure uh, 1,500 cars, people going to work in the morning, I'll be waiting there for a half an hour to get onto Carpenter's Way. Um, the second, uh, the, the number five on my list is existing uh, 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 infrastructure. Excuse me, I'm going through some chemo and my brain just isn't working properly. But anyways, existing uh, infrastructure. What about the water and the sewer and the electric and the storm drains? We're going to get rid of all this green area, and where's the water going to go? How many how, how many of our houses are going to get flooded? I mean, we have water build up now in the last hurricane. Uh, I'm sorry, but you're going to get rid of all this this green area where the water can percolate and and. Uh, and go away into the into the aquifers, and then number four, the roundabouts. <laughs> there's 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 information here where it's where it's where roundabouts are a hazard to pedestrians because the cars don't stop. They just keep going. So how do you get across the street? So roundabouts. Are, are becoming a thing of the past. Roundabouts are old. Roundabouts are going out. There's going to be lawsuits. And the other thing I wanted to say is when they build these four or story buildings uh, and they didn't drive piles down to bedrock and we have a failure, is Lakeland going to be sued for allowing a four-story or a three-story building to be built in a swamp? Thank you. Thank you for listening to my rant. I, I really do appreciate it. But th there is a lot more to this story than, than, than these people over here uh, are, 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 are coloring it such a beautiful thing. It's not a beautiful thing, folks. It's destroying our neighborhood. Thank you.
Well, my name is Dennis Brown, uh, 807 Swan Drive, Lakeland, Florida. I have been employed at uh, Wedgwood for five years or so, back in the early uh, 2000s and late 90s, currently trying to shoot my age when I thought, thought it was going to be at Wedgwood. It's all about the golf course to me somewhat, but this gentleman is so right in that the traffic there is already horrible. Horrible. I have in uh, the Lakeland Park Drive, it's a beautiful drive, but I sat there and watched thousands of truckloads of dirt try to beat the swamp there. And it didn't win very easily. I think it took almost a year to build that road of a quarter or half a mile or three quarters of a mile, whatever. And Literally, I counted 20 cars, but one of the last times I, I use that road all the time, all the time. I live less than a mile from the, from the golf course, what used to be a nice golf course. Why don't y'all just buy that and make it a golf course again? But it is absolutely unbelievable the amount of traffic that is on that road now. I don't know how they get these figures, and I'm not disputing them or calling them liars or anything, but I mean, I've seen the road from 98 back to the road that crosses by the sheriff's office is jammed every single light, practically, no matter what time of the day. The roads are not acceptable for the amount of traffic now. And as this gentleman said, I don't know how many more cars it could be. And I don't know about roundabouts or anything. All I know is that the light at uh, Carpenter's Way is a four or five minute light when it handles all three of the, the sections going right now, going into Sam's, coming out of Sam's, that, that coming out of Sam's, it'll be all the way back to where the turn is to go around to uh, uh, Mall Hill Road. It's absolutely unbelievable. And I mean, where does the uh, progress or the development stop? I mean, we're growing leaps and bounds in the whole state of Florida, and are we being... Uh, aware of what, what he's just said. What is it gonna mean? And I'm telling you, that golf course is wet. And that swamp should have proved it in the building of Lakeland Park Drive. That was a massive undertaking that in my mind was not successful, though it's a beautiful road and people turn left there and they turn right onto Wedgwood Drive, I mean, uh, yeah, Wedgwood Way, Carpenter's Home Way. It's a tough, tough situation, and I highly recommend that y'all really think about this before you approve this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other public comments? You're welcome. David DeMarce, owner of Audubon Oaks Apartments at 1120 East Kennedy Boulevard, Unit 225, Tampa. Um, I'd like to say I actually appreciate the changes that they've made, uh, especially at Parcel 2, uh, changing the orientation of the buildings. Um, and especially in 10 as well, uh, bringing them down to two stories. Um, the one thing I just want to bring up is they talked about the buffer in the uh, fence that they're going to put in in eight. Um, you know, I'd like to consider uh, a fence and the buffer around uh, parcel two as well. Um, not necessarily a visual buffer, uh, but more of a physical buffer. Um, in some cases, especially in 10, our pool and our clubhouse is closer <laughs> to their buildings than their clubhouse would be. And so we just want that physical buffer to, to, to keep people kind of on their own properties. Um, and not a, a, a vinyl fence that would, I think that would close everything off, more of an open fence, um, like a black uh, aluminum style fence that, that would keep everything open and keep the flow of the communities, uh, but keep that physical buffer, keep people from parking at our place or our people parking at their place um, and, and keeping the amenities separate. That's all I have. Good morning, Keith Graham, 976 Lake Baldwin Lane, Orlando, Florida. I represent the owner of the Loop. Um, 
we appreciate the changes that the applicant has made uh, by way of clarification, especially since um, we just heard that the owner of the other apartment complex prefers open fences. Uh, my client specifically discussed with the applicant that we would do a six foot vinyl fence to add to the visual buffer since the townhome people aren't necessarily going to want to look at the apartments. The apartment people aren't necessarily going to be looking at everybody's backyards. Um, and uh, we'd re uh, request that uh, the conditions are clear that the added fence um, uh, and the removal of the cart path from our property for security purposes are conditions of approval. And with those conditions, uh, my client actually would support the uh, applicant's request uh, in this matter. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mike Wagner, 4240 Staffordshire Drive. And before my three minutes starts, I do have a question. Um, parcel 9 is still a blank check um, as far as I'm concerned. I don't see any conceptual drawings. I don't see any ideas there. And I'd like them to please the, um, the people that are asking for their variance to explain what they intend to build there. Well, <clears throat> I, sir, you, you don't uh, get to ask questions. If you have a question and you put it to the board and they, they could, somebody from the board could then put that question to, to them, I could answer for you that leaving it blank means that legally they would not be allowed to put anything there without coming back through this process again. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but if you So it's my understanding that because that's a green space, that's what they're applying for, right? It would have to remain a green space. And, and if they wanted to put something there, they'd have to come through this very enjoyable process again. <laughs> and That'd be a major, major modification to the PUD, which means it comes back through for public hearing, PNC action, and then it goes to the city commission. All right, great. So when I was here in September, I, I want to clarify something. Um, I was not aware that you all were volunteers. I re mistakenly referred to you as employees. I, I would like to uh, amend that. So um, and thank you for what you're doing. Um, I realize this is an important decision, and there's a lot of people at stake. And um, what I would like you to consider are the, the current people that are paying taxes. I own some property that uh, I have for my long-term plans. And if I wish to make an improvement on them, I know that there are, um, I have to go and I have to apply and I have to uh, agree to the rules that are already there. It, it sounds to me like the people that are here bought property and they have a right to build on this property, although we wish it was still a, a golf course. But now they're asking you to add things like, um, you know, four-story apartments that weren't there before. And, and I would ask, how does that benefit the taxpayers of this city? It really doesn't. It benefits the owners of the property alone. And they, they mentioned that, um, you know, they anticipate going from 0.71 to 0.85 in terms of volume of capacity. My qu and they give themselves a C. And in school, you know, I personally, if I got a C, I was happy, but I don't know about y'all. But what I'm saying to you is, what if it doesn't? What if they're wrong? What if their estimate is wrong? And, and like this gentleman just shared, he has to wait 30 minutes to get out of his, um, at a, onto the street that he wishes to get onto. That affects us. So um, I think that's everything that I had. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else? Yeah. Oh, wait. Sorry. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak again. I'm Gina Ward, a resident at 4037 Derby Drive, and have been for nearly 20 years. I come before each of you today to retain the Wedgwood Golf Course current zoning of residential low and medium. This zoning was established a long time ago for a reason. If the golf course could not operate profitable as recreational green space, it could be developed as a mass majority of land was zoned for low and medium. 
This 90-year-old 18-hole par 70 golf course known as Wedgwood Golf Course took golf enthusiasts and some hackers on a 6,400-yard adventure from tee box to the cups on each hole. The adventure took golfers past many water elements designed for storm water flow, passing through some townhomes, some very well-established single-family homes, even passing by some well-managed and maintained apartment properties, too. This is an area of town that we bought homes and houses to make our home. We're willing to share our North Lakeland community with some new residents, but not too many. We welcome new homes, townhomes, and new apartment communities to the surrounding property. With the 312 apartment townhomes already approved for Carpenter's Way as Lake Gibson Village Phase 2, just an eighth of a mile from Heather Point Drive, the next half mile of Carpenter's Way will have 11 ingresses and egresses between the existing properties and now the new proposed roads for the development. This is incomprehensible. Holding this development to the current course zoning will allow a beautiful single-story family homes on nice size home sites with pools, <coughs> compatible townhomes that can be built next to properties that have existing patio and town townhomes and some two and three story apartment buildings that are next to Audubon Oaks property and down by Lakeland Park Drive. This is how you grow a cohesive community inside of an existing neighborhood. Four story buildings do not fit here. Removing the proposed residential high density request and eliminate the four story apartments from the PUD. Residential medium zoning will allow for two and three story apartments. Only then will we have a new development that is compatible within Wedgwood Estates, Heather Point Lake Estates, Cambridge on the Green, Cambridge on the T, Fairfield on the T, Sand Wedge Villas, the Loop at Wedgwood Apartments, and Audubon Oaks. We are the Wedgwood community. This will ease our traffic concerns, provide more green space appeal to further mitigate <coughs> drainage, stormwater, and retention ponds concerns. Please do not allow the zoning of residential high to overdevelop this historic residential neighborhood. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Jack English. I live at 8923 Laurie Lane. I'm on the board of directors for Cambridge on the T, which has always been omitted. It's a 24 unit townhome community. But um, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members, third bite at the apple. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. I appreciate the uh, developer investor coming before us and trying to make some changes. Um, track nine is still in question with regards to development, as I understand, and the attorney has already said that it'll have to come back before the whole process all over again. Appreciate that because our back door is on track nine. Appreciate the change to track eight, which comes out right at our driveway, which helps us. However, as we move along, we only currently have in the whole Wedgwood community, as Gina has outlined, 800 and 48 residences to increase it by another 994 the density there will not hold the traffic count numbers that they're talking about wedgwood drive is the one of the collectors that goes into it but carpenter's way is the main thoroughfare it's a little two-lane road and I'm going to close early for you guys today, but just think about if Cleveland Heights Golf Course was closed. I know it's 27 holes. It's not 18 holes. And Edgewood Drive was going to be impacted the way Carpenter's Way was, how you would react. Or if Grasslands was closed and it was going to be developed with multiple multifamilies like this, how would Edgewood Drive and Grasslands Boulevard and Hardin Boulevard be affected. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, good morning. My name is Bill Berman. I live at 136 Heather Point Drive, uh, and I, I'm here speaking for the uh, 
additionally speaking, in it before the HOAs. And the, the, the topic of compatibility has been brought up over and over and over again. And for those of us that already live in the Wedgwood community, compatibility, compatibility would be not a, forcing our community to change, but to be developed in a way that both the new and the old community can successfully live and work together. If you look at what's been done around the, our community, there is no high density single family residences. We read in the paper about North 98 and some of the surrounding areas and what, has, what is being built. Some of that's in the county, but some of it's in the city. You don't see four story buildings. So I would ask the board to look closely at whether a high density, a high zoning fits within Wedgwood. Thank you. Anyone else from the club? Kevin, do you have? All right. Um, first of all, there's a number of things I want to touch on. Um, but probably first and foremost on uh, that I want addressed is transportation. So I'm going to ask Mr. Taylor to come up and talk about some of the transportation comments and um, his analysis. Good morning. So um, a couple of things we heard that we just wanted to reply to. Um, there was a number thrown around 1,500 vehicles. The, the way we generate the trips for these things are we use um, industry data that comes from empirical um, projects across the country and, and much of that is in Florida uh, to determine what the trip rate is per each sort of unit type. And then we apply those, those trip rates to the quantities to generate the anticipated. So again, based on empirical data, what we're projecting for the AM peak hour from the generation of these units is not 1,500, but in fact about 400. Um, and that's then split in and out. So 100 in in the AM, 300 out in the AM. And in the PM, it looks similar, except the directionality is um, reversed. Uh, the, the reduction in the AM peak hour from what you saw last month to what you're seeing today is about 19% reduction in trips in the AM peak hour and 14 in the PM peak hour. Uh, and then once those trips are on the road, it's not as if they're all in one place at one time. About half of those trips are going to head to um, US 98, and the other half is split between Lakeland Park Drive and uh, to State Road 33 via Florida Ave or some other, some other roadways. So um, again, at any one place, we're, we're talking about 100 peak hour trips to, to 150, not necessarily 400, which is the total and definitely not 1,500. Um, the roundabout is, it was, was talked about as a, um, a way, something that may be unsafe. In fact, roundabouts are really taking hold in Florida and across the country for the opposite reason. They calm traffic down, so they're, they're, they're something that as you approach it, and the curve is physically, maintain your speed lower because in order to take the curve, once, the, once you approach the roundabout, it calms the traffic down. Um, it allows for more equitable access to Carpenter's Way. So folks that are waiting at Wedgwood to get to Carpenter's Way won't wait as long because you only yield to the traffic that's in the circle. Um, DOT has done a number of studies before and after on roundabouts, uh, particularly for safety because that was really the intention of bringing them to the main, main, um, main, main point throughout the area beyond the traffic calming they found that it's safer for both pedestrians and vehicles. Um, the crash rate may not necessarily be less, but the intensity of those crashes is less. Um, and, I, and I'll stand by for any other uh, questions from the board on traffic. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Any questions of Mr. Taylor while he's available? Okay. Um, just a couple other things I want to point out. Uh, let me see. Can you? Well, we can leave it here. This, this, we can talk from this. Um, 
from a from a stormwater there was a comment about stormwater based on the site plan that we have today we've already provided 17 and a half percent of the overall site is a is assigned toward stormwater retention and things of that nature that said even though there's 17 and a half percent on this site plan we still have to go through the erp permitting we have to get the engineering design we have to go through all of those steps and that number may go higher it could go lower but it has to meet the criteria of the water management district we cannot get a development permit to move one ounce of dirt until we get that permit in place um, we are aware of the existing conditions on the site we are aware that lakeland central park the original piece of that uh, road was built in a wetland we are not building in the wetlands. That is an entirely different construct than what we're doing here. We are avoiding the wetlands. We will be uh, making enhancements to the stormwater management system. Uh, it will function better at the end of the day as a result of the development. Um, Mr. Taylor addressed the, the transportation issues better than I ever could, so I'm not even going to attempt to talk about those. But when you, um, Mr. Graham's comments on the loop, completely agree with his comments uh, as related my intent was cer certainly an opaque fence uh, that will be shown in the exhibit and those exhibits will become part of the ordinance and codified um, as well as the removal of the uh, pedestrian connection i will continue a conversation with the, mr dmarce related to, to fencing and what that might look like uh, around audubon oaks uh, and our project as we continue through, through the process, but happy to engage in those, continue to engage in those conversations as well. Um, when we bring this all back to kind of where we are, kind of, you know, this is round three of the Planning Commission hearings, right? We've talked about this project a lot. When we started into this project, if you recall, we were at 1,400 units at that point, including an ALF on, on, uh, 9, 9A, 9B. That road at that time was going behind, immediately behind those residents' homes. Completely agree with your council's uh, opinion as it relates to what's happening on 9A and 9B. Right now it's green space. If it wants to be something besides green space, it has to come back through this process and go through, through the PUD modification. Um, it is residential low land use classification right now so that is from a high level what potentially could go there some sort of residential development um, so we, we, we fully agree with that but that is going to be green space under our plan when you go from our original planning commission hearing in, in May to where we are today based on the acreages and the existing land use classifications that are on the ground today without changing anything I can get more units than what we are asking for in this PUD modification. Yes, we are asking for a piece of it to go to residential high because at the same time, we are asking for a large portion of it to go to residential low from residential medium. So what you're seeing is a shifting of the density from the north end and focusing the density where is residential medium here, these units would be allowed today under the current land use and the density. We're pushing our intensity south and east away from the existing residents and up toward I-4, up toward Lake Lakeland Central Park Drive. That's good, considerate planning. Yes, we are asking for a piece of it to go to residential high. But again, that is just to accommodate that one area. It is not um, an overall increase in the intensity of the site. So what I'm saying is, is that yes, some changes, but it's compatible. It's respectful of the existing community. The changes particularly, uh, I really, you know, and here, these were townhomes originally. We've now matched the single family with the single family. You will not be able to tell these developments apart two-story product again in here around the two-story product this makes sense this is a good project it's been a long process for us it's been a long process for y'all it's been a long process for the residents and i very much appreciate their continued participation i do firmly believe that this is an important part of the process but this is a good project um, we believe it's compatible we have a staff recommendation of approval with a couple minor changes that we'll need to process on the, the exhibits. Um, 
we would request a favorable vote from this board today on the land use change and on the PUD modification. My team is here to engage in any additional questions, conversations that this board may have. Thank you for your time. I have one more question actually for the traffic gentleman, um, and it might be to alleviate some fears, but the roundabout around Lake Hollingsworth Road has plenty of signage and, and crosswalk delineation for pedestrians, should there be any, and I'm assuming that this one will have the same? Correct. By DOT standard, they require pedestrian crossing at all four approaches, and they're oriented in such a way that the pedestrians cross in the direction of the opposing traffic, so that it's, it's very clear that the pedestrians see the traffic, the traffic sees the pedestrians. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions, members of the board? Chuck, you want to answer? Um, the only question I have, Mr. Chair, is whether or not you think it would be helpful to go back through and review the conditions again uh, so everybody's clear in terms of how, what, what, what the board is voting on. Um, and then, uh, Philip, if you want to I'm fine with that. And the one thing that I, on the conditions that I've, I've failed to mention, there was a concern about future traffic, what happens down the road. There is a specific condition in our conditions of approval that require us to do an updated traffic study. I believe it's in 2027. Yeah. So. Yes, sir. Well, we, we generally do not allow second, second round of comments. It's your call, Mr. Chair, but yes, you're correct. We don't normally allow an additional round of comments. This, this was unusual in and of itself, frankly. Okay, we'll just go through the uh, changes just real quick to the um, zoning conditions here. Um, under permitted uses, we did um, add a single family attached uh, residential for track eight, and it was removed from the um, the multifamily there, uh, tracks 2, 3, 4, 10, 9, 11. Go ahead, Philip. And the adjustment for the unit count there, uh, single family has stayed the same. Next slide, Philip. Uh, for track A, uh, we did allow for single, 60 single family attached dwelling units. And track three, uh, the multifamily residential was reduced um, down to total of 874 there for tracks 2, 3, 4, 10, and 11. Next slide. Uh, the single family um, development standards for tracks one did not change. Next slide. Uh, same thing for five, six, and seven. Uh, we did add new standards for um, the single family attached. Um, that would be for the um, setbacks and other requirements here. So that is the uh, minimum lot, uh, maximum building height will be two stories, and then the maximum number of drawings per group will be six there. Uh, but otherwise, it will be in the site plan um, that was presented before you today. And, and the highlighting is just we need to renumber. The, well, we were off one on the Roman numeral uh, towards the bottom, and so we're, we'll, we'll renumber uh, those conditions. Okay, and the multifamily, um, the those requirements did not change. Uh, we did clarify, next slide, Philip. Um, the four story building heights will be limited to the specific buildings identified. And they cite the data table um, and the site plan shown as exhibit W3 and exhibit W7. All the other multifamily buildings will be limited to a maximum height of either two or three stories as specified in exhibit W7. And these conditions um, pretty much stay the same here. And check and go to transportation here. Um, for, for F access, um, you know, basically, the access uh, from the development tracks into Carpenter's Way would be in compliance with Exhibit W3. Um, the access improvements would be constructed in accordance with the Department of Transportation or city standards as appropriate as determined at the time of permitting. Um, all roads within the development shall be uh, constructed in accordance with the city's standards. Um, access to the Unified Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America Cemetery shall be formalized through a recorded agreement. Uh, and, if, and if an agreement already exists, then the agreement will need to be provided prior to issuance of the first building permit for the development. Uh, 
And under G here, these conditions did not um, change except that um, track A was um, removed because it will no longer be a, um, I guess under um, G2, we need to kind of correct that. That was not, it was within there, for, we'll, we'll revise that. Um, signage will be in accordance with the line development code, um, as well as uh, outdoor lighting. Uh, the lighting shall be fully shielded, uh, uh, type so that it would minimize the impacts to the surrounding to the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, stormwater ponds will also be uh, designed as features to have a natural appearance and shape. Uh, fencing shall be minimized, but uh, in the event the fencing is required, this material shall uh, consist of either black or green vinyl chain link or decorative metal, uh, metal picket fencing. Uh, any landscaping shall be located on the outside of such fencing. Um, going to the transportation conditions, uh, prior to the first site plan or plat submittal, the developer shall execute a, uh, a development agreement. Um, development agreements have to go through two hearings with the city commission, and that's when it will lock down the actual transportation concurrency and transportation uh, concurrency entitlements. Uh, the uh, uh, is included as part of that effort will include the right-of-way dedication to the city to accommodate the future extension of Lincoln Park Drive uh, south of Carpenter's Way. Uh, the dedicated right-of-way and design shall minimize impacts to an existing gas transmission line and accommodate necessary stormwater treatment facilities for the future roadway or shared facilities uh, for the roadway and adjacent development. Um, the right-of-way dedication and construction of uh, a roundabout at the Carpenter's Way Wedgwood Estates Heather Point intersection will also be uh, included as part of that agreement, including the realignment of Wedgwood Estates Boulevard to align with Heather Point as generally illustrated in Exhibit W5A. Um, the installation of a transit shelter and bus bay uh, will also be required on Lincoln Park Drive at the entrance to Tracks 3 and 3B to serve the realignment of the Citrus Connections pink, uh, pink line, which is anticipated to occur once the apartment development phases commence. Uh, right now that line runs down um, uh, North Florida Avenue, and so the intent would be is to shift it over to uh, Lincoln Park Drive to serve the development. And then as noted before, a, a major update to the Wedgwood Redevelopment Traffic Impact Study, which is uh, originally dated in, in March of, of 22 and is updated uh, incrementally during this process, shall be conducted for all remaining project phases for which building permit has not been requested by September 1st, 2027. So um, that does give us a chance to come back and revisit uh, the assumptions that were included in this analysis. Um, condition three just talks about the integrated multi-use trail network as illustrated and as modified based on our conversation today. Uh, any of the crosswalks across Carpenter's Way shall be raised uh, to make sure that we do um, calm traffic in that interaction between the trail system and the, and the public street system. Um, concurrent with construction of Carpenter's Way, Wedgwood Estates Boulevard, Heather Point Roundabout, sidewalk shall also be constructed over to connect with the existing sidewalk adjacent to Douglas Cook Park so that there's an immediate pedestrian connection provided uh, for residents. Uh, and then ADA compliant sidewalks shall be constructed between the principal multifamily residential buildings and amenities uh, and that the, that the network also connects to the trail system so that we've got a good uh, bicycle pedestrian network that serves everybody, connects to the individual units uh, uh, that are developed. Uh, bicycle parking is required in, in, in compliance with the city's LDC and engineering standards manual. Um, we're also requiring that prior to certificate of occupancy for track two, the roadway stub out shall be constructed to the eastern project boundary to support the future uh, connection to Artiva Drive. And then um, here, you know, current and future developers within the PUD shall work with the city to support efforts to locate a high-speed rail stop somewhere in this, in this area. That's been something that we've talked about for a very long time. And so whether it's at US 98 or somewhere else in the area, we just want to have that out there to uh, uh, establish a, a spirit of cooperation in that process. Chuck, you had okay. just a go back to the traffic study update. Next slide. Next slide. Oh. There we go. Yeah. So I guess two scenarios. So they get out the front and there's nothing new coming up because everything's been established. Um, if they're not in the ground but they have their permit, we're not going to see anything from a traffic study standpoint um, and then I guess my other question would be if 
they haven't gotten the permit, they run the, the study and it does show we need to do something. Are they still responsible at that point? Really, I it would, it's something that we're going to need to we would need to work out through an amendment to the development agreement. If there are new conditions that are, arise because of the development, the developer will have to address those. Um, if there's if it's something related to background growth that's not tied to the development, and, and, and I'm thinking just specifically related to US 98, then that's then that's something that we would not uh, hold the developer account, account accountable for, and that's primarily related to Florida. Florida statute, Florida law. So, um, if it's really the intent here is is to better uh, get a handle on the operational impacts of the development related to Carpenter's Way and the other internal streets within within the community, but also give us the ability to look at those pinch points that we know exist today, and, and we're still concerned about uh, like like the residents are about Carpenter's Way and US 98. Um, you know. The city comes in and does something ahead of ahead of this date, then that's something that will be factored into that analysis. We are able to extend Lincoln Park Drive to the south, um, and that impacts the traffic distribution and allocation on the surrounding street system. We want to be able to account for that in this analysis. If there's an additional concurrency failure because of the distribution of traffic, if more traffic is trying to head east towards Florida Avenue or Sokrum Loop, this re redo would allow us to be able to flag that and, and to get mitigation accordingly. So really, this is to get a lot of the assumptions, you know, to, to, to verify the assumptions that were done as part of this analysis. And really, a five-year timeline, uh, we believe, is reasonable to be able to do that because of the things that are happening in the area, not only tied to the timeline of this development, but also just changes in background traffic and other investments that are being made uh, in, in the area. I guess the only, the only thing to follow is, is there anything that the city would want to Consider to give us a little bit more teeth in having them again. If, if something doesn't change based on the empirical data we're using, the turn lanes are needed or something that we could then put that on the developer. Or is that just something we typically would not do and uh, handle it based on their impact costs or whatever? You know, I think that's something that we would want to get to in terms of the development agreement. Um, what we've done, and probably the most recent development agreement that we've that we've executed that included a proportionate share component was Riverstone, and that was about five years ago. We've we've executed others since then, but Riverstone had a prop share agreement. I think that would be something that we'd want to look at is is you know some type of, and I don't want to say necessarily prop share because that also implies impact fee credits, and so what is the public really getting out of this? But if it's a proportional share of an additional mitigation requirement where the city or DOT or somebody else is sharing in that cost, then I think we would want to deal with that as part of the development agreement and have language to address that as part of that, that document. And that's something I'm sure the city commission is going to want to see as well. So that's going to be something basically left up to the city commission to decide on. Right, and you that's... Can't, you can't say, well, we're going to do this now, but we, when you sign an agreement under A, we're going to switch gears on you on B three years later. Exactly, and that's, and that's one of the things we want to be very clear about is that the zoning, the, 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 the modified PUD as it's being presented today would not provide transportation entitlements without having that separate development agreement that requires the city commission action. And the city commission action... Um, you know, we're probably going to parrot um, quite a bit of the transportation conditions related to the right of way dedication, the roundabout, the transit uh, transit stop, those types of things. But there are also going to be some, um, you know, we're, we're going to want to you know, be clear in terms of the expectations that full impact fees are paid, uh, city transportation impact fees are paid for the developments that are moving forward. We're going to want to get into if something comes out of this 2027 analysis, do we amend the development agreement to add additional mitigation, or do we just have a standard um, standard language related to a proportional contribution of any additional cost? Those are the things that are, you know would be part of that DA process that really aren't zoning related, but are clearly going to be key traffic issues that the commission is going to want us to address. And certainly, the residents have the opportunity to provide comment as part of that that process through a development agreement all affected landowners would be notified that those hearings would be beginning I and mean, that would happen fairly soon but there's that 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 would be a transportation focused conversation before the city commission 
I just have a quick question for the applicant. The townhomes that are being proposed are going to be owner occupied, correct? Thereby increasing the tax base? That's correct. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Two more. Um, was there a condition on water wastewater? I know they were looking at a study about um, at least wastewater, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? We had stormwater, some open space, utility, that kind of We're already working on a study related <coughs> to the to water and sewer, and we absolutely have to connect to your to the city's systems, and we'll go through the normal design review concurrency process. And then maintenance, I didn't see anything in the um, conditions about, uh, you had talked about HOA uh, handling that, but is there anything that we would want to incorporate in the condition? Yeah, we can certainly add a condition there that was gonna be my question, and also um, the testimony today, um, you saw from the um, the representative for the loop apartments and for um, Audubon Oaks, they had specific um, requests regarding fencing. Yep. I know the applicant indicated they were going to include a, um, a fence as part of um, track eight there. I believe it was a vinyl fence that would be appropriate for single family attached. Uh, we would require, I'd say, minimum six foot high fence. Um, they're going to update the exhibits for the trail and landscape buffer. The other um, request um, for multifamily next to multifamily, that's not a standard code requirement. Uh, but it sounds like they would like to have a um, some type of um, chain link um, fence, either vinyl, bike or vinyl green coated, um, was my perception. Or, or estate fencing. Or estate fencing, something there that would um, provide a you know visual permeability, but at least physically separate that. So uh, the question is, do you want to require that as well? That would be your your you know up to you. We're going to work with the Audubon Oaks folks on the fencing because I want to make sure that whatever fencing we agree to is you know, acceptable aesthetically to both parties. So if the direction is go talk to Audubon Oaks and figure out what that is and we can memorialize it, I would encourage us to go that direction rather than specifically say it's going to be a chain link fence or whatever today because Audubon Oaks may not want a chain link fence. Do you have any objection to us um, specifying the fencing that we've identified for our ponds or whatever is mutually agreeable between two parties. I just don't want to get into a sense where we leave it open and y'all can't come to an agreement and we're sort of stuck. Let me look at that language real quick. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have it memorized. And, and while Mr. Allen is looking at that, uh, just to clarify, also going back to utilities and, and our concurrency determination process. So when we have new development activity coming in, we look at we really, really look at four four things. We look at transportation concurrency, school concurrency, and water and wastewater concurrency. And so in terms of being able to ensure that the that the water and wastewater infrastructure is able to support the development through build out, that is going to go through a, a not only a master planning process with the water utilities department, which is which is underway. But it's also going to, uh, with each site plan that comes in, there is a separate review by the Water Utilities Department to make sure that whatever is in place at any given time can support that phase of the development. Um, so that's something that we, you know, we, we would be able to handle as part of the normal development review process. Chuck, can I ask a question? I guess both of you and Jared. If we approve, if we're being asked to approve, if, if, to agree to the, uh, to, to the decision of, of the department to to uh, go ahead and approve what the uh, requests of the, uh, of the developer, subject to these conditions we're seeing up here. Is there any way to include in there, there's several things out there, it seems to me, that aren't in the conditions that are possible areas of concern. <clears throat> A lot of times what we've done where um, the staff might have some minor amendments to the to the written conditions that have been proposed. Uh, a board member will make a motion to accept as presented by staff, mm -hmm. and that's usually sufficient enough. And it's just up to the staff then at that point to make um, any kind of clarifications between what was orally presented versus what is written. Okay. Um, really, the bottom line is just to make sure that it's clear what what the board intends. Um, is be, it, that the staff is going to be conveying that on to the city commission. Okay. 
So if it's the intention of the board or the motion, whoever makes the motion uh, to include those additional uh, recommended um, conditions, I just always ask that, that we get on record the applicant's agreement to it because our, our code um, specifically for PUDs um, requires the, the applicant to agree to the conditions. So that's why you always at, see me asking if they agree to them because um, technically we should get their agreement on those conditions. If they disagree um, and that condition is a uh, in, the, in the mind of the person making the motion, that that condition is necessary in order to achieve compliance and, and the applicant doesn't agree to it, then that is a basis to deny the application. So that's um, kind of the why the, we talk about agreeing to the condition or not. That being said, we have the conditions, conditions here that we're talking about. What about some of the conversation that's, that's uh, come about after we went through this? about some possibilities of other things that need, may come up for consideration. I mean, you, you can't hold the, the, the contract, the, the developer, I understand, you can't hold that responsible in perpetuity for something that might come up 10 years, 12, 20 years down the road. But it seems to me there's some issues in there that really have not been totally resolved at this point. Right, and that, that's always going to be the case for this yeah. process because is, this is pretty much the first Thing that happens in, in the development process. So, um, I mean, the board can impose, I know, for example, um, you know, traffic has been talked about a lot, and, and Mr. Barnaby was talking about the, the concurrency process that kind of comes later, uh, where the city essentially gets another bite of the apple to address con, uh, traffic concerns. Um, and th it doesn't mean that the board cannot get into further detail. Um, if, if the board doesn't feel like the burden of, uh, of proof has been met with regard to <clears throat> mitigating all the concerns with traffic. But th this is something that we've talked about a lot is that the more um, of a burden that you impose on the applicant at this early stage where they're still um, you know, trying to, to figure out what they can and can't do, then that's, you're putting a lot of cost on the front end of, of development where they're, they don't really have a guarantee um, or any real assurances that they're going to actually be able to develop. So you're, you're putting a lot of risk and cost onto someone in the front end. It's not to say that you couldn't if you felt that it was required in order to show that, that this would adequately be addressed, um, but, but it does impose a, that cost. And there is another opportunity later um, to, to um, get more into the details of those sorts of things and, and as Chuck was describing the development agreement process and that goes through our uh, through public hearings as well um, so there and, and the same is true for um, with stormwater I don't, that doesn't have the same public hearing um, process but it, it it does have to get approved by Swift mud and 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 uh, the other uh, authorities so, um, there are uh, there are other steps that come after this, um, where right, those part. those other issues will be addressed in further detail. Okay. As lengthy as the zoning process has been, there's a there's a there's a more lengthy lengthier uh, process when you come into the actual plan submittal, the engineer design plans, the permitting. Um, really where the, where the rubber meets the road, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny that goes in, not only by city staff, but others. And so this is, this is one step, if approved, in a very long process going forward. So if, today is the first time I've heard any mention of the impact fees. But it's my understanding that those fees that would be collected as part of those projects does not necessarily fund a road project for Carpenter's Way or anything like that. It goes into a general fund that's used throughout the city. Correct, and that's one of the one of the big elements, at least in my mind, and it's just me talking. But it, one of it, one of the big elements of the development agreement is is specifying how the how those dollars would be allocated, because you're correct. Our impact fee collections are split between two districts, North Side and South Side. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, that is something where we would want to make sure that whatever is collected in terms of city transportation impact fees is allocated to projects in, in, this, in this area. So that is, that is a very big point. And I, and I agree with what Mr. Barmby said and, and 
Mr. Simpson were talking about there as it relates to, this is a, an early step in the process. We're asking for a site plan, a, just a binding site plan at this point. We're, this doesn't give us concurrency. This doesn't guarantee us the ability to go build tomorrow. There's a tremendous amount of engineering. There's a tremendous amount of work with uh, your staff and your city council as it relates to developers agreements and all of those things to to get it to where we can go through the next process and if there are issues that are addressed during those further engineering design they have to be addressed um, and they have to be put in place and concurrency has to be met before we're allowed to, to pull a single building permit so there, there's still safeguards in the process to make sure that all of our impacts are addressed I, I can assure you um, this isn't the first time that this staff will, will look at this site plan as, as Chuck said he's probably going to be seeing more of me than, than he probably wants to uh, <laughs> as it relates to, to this project but going back to Commissioner Locke I didn't forget about you uh, the, the language related to the stormwater pond uh, I believe there's some decorative metal fencing language contained within it that that's acceptable we can we can that gives me enough flexibility to work with uh, auto on Oaks to make sure that whatever's implemented is is um, acceptable to all parties I would just I would just com comment to that as well that we, we have had issues in cases of the past where we've had language that mutually agreeable uh, to the parties type language has, has created issues in the past so I would recommend against including language like that and if they're agreeable mm -hmm. to the language that's already in and then um, and that gives them the flexibility then I would recommend that is there any objection to a specified and or mutually agreeable I just is that our job well I don't know I, I don't want to what it does is it, if the, essentially it puts the person that that um, that that would need to consent to that it essentially puts them into a position of potentially blocking the development in some way um, by refusing to agree and we've had that issue um, in other situations before so that's why I recommend against it we're all I'm, here we can address it now let's if we say mutually agreeable later then that could put all that could put the applicant um, and the city in a difficult position later based on my prior conversations with Audubon Oaks decorative metal fencing is is adequate yes. right. I have no other comments or questions from the board uh, we will entertain a motion to approve the recommendation of staff. Do a motion for that. Okay. Go I'd like to make a motion. Um, I guess before the motion, I just I, I want to share. I think the developers made a lot of movement on some of our concerns and addressed a lot of the uh, items and issues, at least on on my take. So. I don't know if anybody else wants to speak before the motion. Uh, uh, I do too, and I appreciate you guys going back and forth and back and, and listening to the mixed type of housing that is sorely needed in this town. So I appreciate you guys implementing those townhomes back. Any other just, just for a point of order, I mean, typically the motion is made and seconded, and then the discussion the occurs fire. related yeah. to that motion. Okay. All right. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to accept um, the uh, PUD as presented with the conditions as presented with some minor changes. Um, eliminating the crossing on the loop as indicated by the developer, uh, providing a uh, vinyl fence uh, around uh, track eight. Uh, providing similar fencing as identified um, for the stormwater ponds around Tract 2. Updating the right-of-way on the very southern part of the entire uh, development to include the parcel that was not previously included for the dedication of future right-of-way. Modifying Condition G2 to remove Tract 8. From that language and including maintenance language as a part of conditions as recommended by staff. Second. Okay. Okay. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. 
Mr. Chair, we do we will need to have a roll call vote, yeah, sure. being that yeah. there's uh, opposition. Yeah, sure. Aye. 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 Opposed. Five five to one with uh, Ms. Tom uh, dissenting. Thank you very much for all your time and discussion. I very much appreciate it. My client very much does too. Okay, and this would now move on forward to the um, city commission. Um, yeah, and just to clarify for everyone, there's, there's, uh, this will go on to the city commission for final approval. They will have uh, two readings of that, and there will be another round of public comment at the second reading uh, of that ordinance. So stay tuned. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item six, the general meeting, review minutes of the September meeting. Okay. Is there a motion to approve oh. the minutes of the uh, September meeting? I move that we approve the minutes of the September meeting. Second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Item seven, small scale land use amendment from public buildings, grounds, institutional uses to community activity center and a change in zoning from O2 limited impact office to C4 community center commercial on approximately 2.63 acres located at the southeast corner of East Memorial Boulevard and North Ingram Avenue, 1005 East Memorial Boulevard. Owner, Sage LD1, LLC. Applicant, Shelton Rice, Peterson, and Myers, PA. Good morning, for the record. Um, again, Philip Scarish, Principal Planner with Community Economic Development. We presented this to you last uh, month uh, as public hearing. Uh, we have a recommendation. Uh, again, this is at uh, 10, uh, 1005 East Memorial Boulevard. It's located at the south East corner of East Memorial and North Ingram Boulevard, or North Ingram Avenue, excuse me, right here. <coughs> the subject property was uh, previously known and used by the state of Florida as a courthouse for the second district uh, court of appeals. And improvements uh, on the property consist of a 30,000 square foot office building that was originally built in approximately 1960. Uh, in 2016, the second DCA relocated and abandoned the property due to mold contamination within the office building. In March of this year, the subject property was purchased by the current owner, Sage uh, LD1 LLC. Uh, in May, uh, a demolition permit was issued um, to the owner and, and the, the, the subject building has been, has been demolished. Um, let's run through some slides again. This is the location again at the southeast corner of East Memorial and uh, Ingram Avenue here. Just to run through the slides, this is showing the current zoning of O2. Again, this would be the C4 uh, zoning that's proposed. Uh, this is the public institutional um, and, uh, uh, land use, um, current land use designation. Again, this would be uh, the CAC uh, future land use designation. It's, point, it's important to note that um, this is not just an island of commercial activity center. There is a uh, commercial activity center to the, to the north and to the west. Um, uh, to, the, uh, to the east there, this is the Access Church. That will remain uh, the PI land use. Um, and then just, just past the, um, the church is that uh, space shop um, uh, uh, that was recently approved for about 100,000 square foot uh, um, self-storage facility. Again, just want to go through some slides real quick. This is looking across the site. Um, this is looking south across Memorial Boulevard, uh, looking from the west, um, from the neighboring parcel, uh, looking along west um, on Memorial Boulevard. This is looking east along Memorial Boulevard. This is looking south on Ingram. You see the, the, the reserve center here. Yep. All right. So. Um, I'm going to be jumping through the staff report, so um, be patient with me. The, the community activity center uh, that they propose is, uh, is intended um, 
is intended to accommodate the shopping needs of persons living within the community and typically contains shopping centers with a variety of retail uses. In accordance with the comprehensive plan, such activity centers may be located in intersections of two roads with fronts or direct access, direct access to onto a major arterial, uh, onto an arterial uh, or collector road, or service a driveway which directly serves an arterial roadway, which use memorial as an arterial roadway. Um, both the town center um, shopping center to the west and the former Lakeland Mall property to the north both have a CAC future land use designation as I mentioned previously. And uh, let me just go back to just go back to the location map here while I'm talking. Yep. Here we go. As such, this request uh, represents an expansion of existing activity center um, to the southeast quadrant of East Memorial and North Ingram Avenue. Both East Memorial and North Ingram Avenue are designated as transit-oriented corridors. And um, per policy, um, per future land use policy 1.4a, the city's comprehensive plan states that the intent of a TOC uh, trans transit-oriented corridor, um, the transit-oriented corridor shall encourage a mix of complementary complementary land uses with medium to high residential densities along key designated or existing planned fixed, uh, fixed route transit corridors. All new or redevelopment within TOC shall be designed with uh, pedestrian, bike, and transit uh, facilities. Uh, the city shall promote the following uses within a TAC, or excuse me, a TOC, uh, non-residential uses, um, uh, and we also encourage public, and ironically encourage uh, public institutional uses, uh, uh, residential medium and residential high uses um, in recreation uh, and open green spaces. Um, at this point, there is no plans uh, for development. Again, this is just a straight rezoning uh, to a C4 category. Uh, the uses uh, permitted by right within the C4 include um, uh, uh, offices, uh, banks, hotels, motels, motor vehicle fuel sales minor, motor vehicle fuel sales major, and a broad range of personal service type uses, including barbershops, hair salons, day spas, uh, exercise studios, dance studios, martial arts, and other similar types of um, um, uh, personal service uses. The C4 uh, category uh, zoning designation also permits um, the such uses as a convenience store, dollar stores, um, uh, medical marijuana dispensary facilities, and restaurants with or without drive-through facilities. Um, as a conditional use, uh, C4 could potentially allow for the uh, major motor vehicle fuel sales, um, but that would be subject to approval by the, uh, by the Planning and Zoning Board and then ultimately the City Commission as a conditional use permit. Uh, it's important to note in the staff report that uh, this does uh, this, this request does support the central city area between downtown and Interstate 4. Uh, the central, uh, the plan for the Midtown redevelopment, um, which was a, a plan in, uh, created in 2001 to support the creation of the Midtown redevelopment and the CRA. Um, so I just want to highlight that, um, that it is support those, those activities, those, those, those things in the comprehensive plan. There's my transportation stuff. Um, there's an entire section about transportation uh, concurrency uh, within the staff report. I just want to point out that the, um, again, this is not a, not a PUD, so there's no conditions. Um, they will have to come through with a binding um, concurrency application so we can look at the transportation, the water sewer, and, and, and the um, uh, stormwater as this moves forward. Um, so with, and, um, so, and this is also within the uh, central city supportive areas that we mentioned. Um, the roadway has a level of service E standard uh, measured on an average quarter basis uh, for streets with common trip ends. Due to its location on the TOC, volumes would also, uh, will also be allowed to exceed the generalized capacities if there's adequate transit. And as we, this is a transit corridor. Um, 
and bicycle pedestrian infrastructure uh, would be you know, provided uh, along with that. So um, a lot of moving parts with this, but uh, the overall uh, recommendation is, the, is a recommendation of approval, um, finding it consistent with the comprehensive plan, the CAC, and the C4 uh, zoning designation, uh, consistent with the comprehensive plan, and we do recommend approval. And uh, stand for any questions you may have. Any questions from the board? The comments. Uh, I have a motion to approve the recommendation. I move to approve uh, the change in zoning um, as per staff recommendation. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Item eight. Does that include the, just like curiosity, and that, that, um, with the conditions. Yeah. With the uh, land use as well. Because we had a, there was a land use change associated with that. So I just yes. want to make sure that the motion is yes. yes. for that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Item eight. Report of City Commission action on planning and zoning board recommendations, along with planning and transportation manager's report. All right. Well, uh, Maybe we can get out of here by 1130. Um, the, the City Commission yesterday approved the uh, proposed department community next to Lockheed Martin on South uh, Parkway Frontage Road, as well as the 252-unit uh, apartment community on the south side of Town Park Boulevard at Yates Road. So both of those were approved yesterday. Um, in terms of new cases coming forward, um, we've got a request for um, annexation, land use, and zoning for property uh, south side of 10th Street, west of Brunel Parkway. Um, the Housing Authority is looking to put in a, a, a community of around 80 townhomes. Um, and so that will, be, that will be coming forward next month for hearing. Um, we also have, and this is what I think we've talked about before, but the Lake Gibson Village property immediately west of um, Wedgwood uh, Gibson Trails development will be coming in uh, with a request for an alternative development plan that would allow up to 320 multifamily units. Um, it's kind of an either or with the uh, uh, 558 uh, age restricted multifamily that's already allowed today. So they could either do what they have or go with standard uh, multifamily. That's something that you know, we would start getting into concurrency and other types of things for schools. And, and, and so it's a little slightly different, but the intent is, is to keep the traffic impacts the same. But that's, that's, that'll be coming forward next month as well. Else. And right. As always, thank you for your patience and your time. Um, we do live in exciting times when it comes <laughs> to, to development between growth, affordable housing, and now resiliency kind of step into the forefront. We've, we've, we've got a lot that we're working on, and y'all are uh, kind of got the front seat of history. So very, thank you very much. <laughs> we appreciate your, your commitment yeah. and um, enjoy your early release that I require these developers to fund part of these. Thank